Okay, starting the live stream, one moment. Computer recording has started. Okay, cloud has started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Dane Hope. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity jointly with the Committee on Education. At this time, with all council members and staff, please turn on your videos. I repeat, council members and staff, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. Thank you. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's virtual uh, Committee on Women and Gender Equity and Committee on Education Oversight Hearing on the impact of COVID-19 on childcare in New York City. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I wanna start by thanking Chair Traeger of the Committee on Education for co-chairing this hearing, his leadership on uh, public education has been extraordinary. And I appreciate his time uh, bringing his committee's attention to this important matter. Um, this is in fact the third hearing on childcare we have had this year. Why would the council find it necessary to devote so many hearings, so many hours to childcare? It's because childcare is paramount to the socioeconomic success of New York City. It's because we know that childcare is a gendered issue that disproportionately affects women. We know that single parents, 80% of whom are women and mostly women of color, bear the brunt of the loss of childcare. It's because we know that when families make difficult decisions during this pandemic, it is disproportionately women who give up their job when a family decides one parent should do so because she is lower paid. Access to affordable quality childcare was limited well before we became the national epicenter of COVID-19 and the scale of our problem has grown exponentially. Kudos to this administration for investing in universal pre-K and 3K programs. However, most low and moderate income caregivers continue to struggle because the city offers too few seats and no after school care. While we appreciate the unprecedented challenges of the moment, there is no excuse for the administration's failure to meet even the most modest goal of 100,000 seats for 1.1 million public students, public school students. The fundamental, um, let's see, we are eight months into this pandemic and many parents have given up. They bring their child to work with them or if they can't, quit their jobs. The fundamental question for this committee on women and gender equity is, where is the administration on prioritizing women? Because women, mostly women of color, are losing the gains made by generations of struggle. It's critical to also note the effect of the pandemic on those working in the childcare industry. 93% of childcare workers in New York City are women and they are primarily Latinx and Black. 25% live in poverty, while 53% have incomes low enough to qualify for childcare subsidy. Again, the committee asks, do we pay childcare workers, most of whom are not represented by a union, a living wage? So there's a lot we have to look forward to covering today. 
I want to thank the members of the administration for joining us today from the Department of Education, the Department of Youth and Community Development, and the Committee on, and excuse me, the Commission on Gender Equity. And finally, I want to thank the families, advocates, and providers who have joined us and who have educated us about what is really happening on the ground. We know how busy you are, so please know that for those who can't join us, or if you cannot stay for the whole hearing and you cannot give live testimony today, you may submit your insights in writing to testimony at council.nyc.gov until Saturday at 10 a.m. Your testimony is invaluable as we navigate a path toward the best interests of our children. Before I turn it back to the moderator, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Cindy Cardinal, my legislative directory, uh, Madhuri Shukla, my communications director, Sarah Crean, as well as the committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney Council, Chloe Rivera, Senior Legislative Policy Analyst and today's moderator, Monica Peppel, Financial Analyst and Elizabeth Arts from Community Engagement. And I'd now like to acknowledge, acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us today, who are present and that is just gonna take a nanosecond here. Um, I see council members Ayala, I see council member Borelli, council member Brannon, council member Drum, council member Gurdenchek, Kalos, Lander, Levine, Lewis, Rose, Salamanca, and Ulrich. Um, and I think I introduced more than just my committee. Um, but now I'll turn it over to committee member Traeger. Um, Council Member and Chair Traeger, uh, Chair of the Committee on Education for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, good morning. I'm Council Member Mark Traeger. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, the extraordinary Chair Rosenthal for co-hosting and also leading on this very important oversight hearing with me uh, today. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to note the committee will hear two very important resolutions, which I'm proud to co-sponsor. We'll be hearing resolution 1324, sponsored by council member Lewis, which calls on the New York City Department of Education to partner with nonprofit organizations to provide on-site pro bono legal assistance at schools to help students and their families with housing issues. Additionally, we will be hearing resolution 1473, also sponsored by Councilmember Lewis, which calls upon the New York City Department of Education to provide families of children with disabilities the necessary training and equipment to properly enable distance learning. This is the first time the committee is hearing these two resolutions, so we will not be voting on them today. This school year, there have been numerous changes and school reopening dates and school building closures made at the 11th hour, leaving little time for families to prepare and find childcare. One can only imagine the stress parents who work out of their homes feel after learning that their child's school building will be closed the following day. Parents are already trying to balance their own schedules with the ever-changing ones of their children. The least this administration can do is be queerer more consistent and less sporadic in their communication with families. Access to stable childcare is not just critical in this uh, moment, it is vital to ensuring a full equitable recovery and to preventing temporary instability in a crisis from becoming generational economic disparities cut along gender lines. According to the New York Times, four times as many women as men left the workforce in September. It is well documented that women are financially penalized in the long term for taking breaks in employment and that caregiver status correlates with higher rates of poverty later in life. Some of the gender disparities and impacts of this crisis are even su suggested in the DOE's data on hybrid learning enrollment. 
Prior to the last cutoff, girls were only 44.7% of students in grades nine to 12 enrolled in hybrid learning, a drop of 3.7% from the middle school enrollment rate. If we fail to provide sufficient access to free and accessible childcare, we will continue to see families and particularly mothers making impossible calculations between the cost of childcare and their careers. We are risking deepening existing gendered economic disparities and ensuring that the economic impact of this pandemic on care caregivers is generational. None of this even begins to speak to the mental health impacts on primary caregivers who are trying to maintain a precarious balance between work, supervising remote instruction and remote work and caregiving. I wanna thank my colleagues, council members Rose and Rosenthal for their longstanding focus on caregivers in the intersection between childcare and work and for their partnership on this hearing today. Beyond school building closures, this administration is failing to provide a sufficient number of childcare slots and coverage time to serve the needs of families throughout the city, especially families who work outside of their homes. In July, Mayor de Blasio announced that the city would provide free childcare options for 100,000 children this fall for those in 3K through eighth grade. However, as of October 18th, only about 18,500 students were being served in more than 300 Learning Bridges locations, leaving thousands of students on waiting lists. At that time, DYCD stated that they would continue adding seats on a rolling basis throughout the fall, eventually reaching 100,000 slots by December. As of this month, DOE reports a capacity of 45,000 slots for 3K to eighth grade, of which 39,000 slots have been offered to families. However, current enrollment for the program <coughs> is still unclear. Secondly, 100,000 is nowhere near enough slots for a school system of 1.1 million students. I look forward to hearing from this administration about where it is with meeting and expanding this goal of 100,000 slots. Additionally, <clears throat> I am concerned about the inadequate hours of operation of Learning Bridges. Unlike regional enrichment centers, which were open from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., Learning Bridges programs operate only from 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. with no after-school coverage. Additionally, while DYCD continues to operate many of their after-school programs, DYC indicated in a call with elected officials that those sites cannot accommodate Learning Bridges students as they have room for the students learning in person at school. The lack of extended day coverage leaves many working parents, especially teachers and other school staff in a difficult position as their workday begins well before 8 a.m. and ends well after three. I am looking forward to hearing how DOE intends to address this critical issue. Also, since the mayor has stated that some schools will now serve students in person five days a week, will the Learning Bridges sites linked to those schools offer seats to students from other schools or to students in the remote only option, or will they close down? Further, DOE states that students with disabilities are among priority groups to receive seats and learning bridges programs, but I have heard from advocates that there are too few seats to meet the needs of this vulnerable student population for whom remote learning is already significantly challenging. I've also heard that these programs are illegally turning away students with serious challenges, such as autism. This is unacceptable. I'm looking forward to hearing how this administration is ensuring that one of our most vulnerable groups of students are properly served. On top of all these challenges, there's also been a reduction in available early childhood seats across the city due to COVID-19. At the outset of this pandemic, all preschools were forced to close with some later allowed to reopen, but many independent preschools are worried that they will not survive. According to a coalition of nine settlement house providers, DOE's recent birth to five early Head Start RFP with funding set to begin July 1st, 2021 will eliminate a large number of childcare slots. 
just among this coalition of nine providers, the provisional RFP awards will result in a loss of 39% of the 1,352 childcare slots serving low-income working families they collectively had in fiscal 2020. Worse, extended daycare slots for these providers may, may be cut dramatically by as much as 72%. These cuts would also impact early childcare workers who are primarily women of color, whose annual average income is $40,000 and would result in the loss of more than 125 jobs among these nine providers alone. However, DOE maintains that these cuts stem from an effort to redirect funding to neighborhoods deemed to have higher needs and will not result in a loss of seats overall. I look forward to hearing more about DOE's rationale in efforts to redirect funding and how will they meet childcare needs of lower income families in all of our communities. I wanna thank everyone who is testifying today. I just wanna thank the city council staff for all of their great work that they put into today's hearing. Malcolm Buterhorn, Jen Atwell, Kalima Johnson, Chelsea Batermore, and Macis Sarkissian. I also wanna thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, and my policy director, Vanessa Ogle. Uh, and I will now turn it back over to Chair Rosenthal, who I believe she is at the other hearing now. Okay, so very, very good. Just also Chair, want to also just make, oh, Chair, are you there? Chair Traeger, can, you can uh, uh, move on to Council Member Lewis. Yes, uh, Council Member Lewis, who is uh, advancing very important resolutions and measures I want to thank her for her leadership and I'd like to please welcome her to say a few words. Thank you, Councilman. Let's unmute Councilmember Lewis. Good morning and thank you. Chair Traeger for the opportunity. I wanna thank both you and Chair Rosenthal for being staunch advocates for education, child care, as well as gender equity. During the onset of the pandemic, the transition from classroom instruction to distance learning became a new challenge for educators, administrators, parents, and students. We uncovered the gravity of the digital divide that left black and brown students disconnected and disengaged. The shortage of digital devices, no access to high-speed internet and computer illiteracy became an unforeseeable obstacle that hindered student progress. I represent District 45, a culturally diverse community where the parents of school-age children have limited English proficiency. They are working one or more, two, one or more jobs to make ends meet yet determined that education must remain a priority for their children. Despite repeated attempts by parents to find technical support and guidance on how to navigate the digital platform, they could not reach specialists to troubleshoot tech issues. Parents struggled. They juggled their new roles as guardian, breadwinner, educator, and IT technicians. Aside from these challenges, families face economic housing and food insecurity. I sponsored two resolutions that would serve as a lifeline by expanding access for families to much needed resources during a critical time. In an ever-changing world, families need stability and a sense of security before they can focus on education of their children. Resolution 1324 calls on the New York City Department of Education to partner with nonprofit organizations to provide on-site pro bono legal assistance at schools to help students and their families with housing issues. Reso 1473 calls on the Department of Education to provide families of children with disabilities the necessary training and equipment to properly enable distance and remote learning. We cannot leave our families and our scholars to fiend for themselves. They need a roadmap to success so that no one is left behind and that's irregardless of their ability. We must ensure that any and all assistance needed to properly execute distance learning is readily available to all of our scholars. Many of us do not know the personal struggles that students and parents are facing, but the one constant is that every school community feels like home. 
these institutions have become a place of learning, education, refuge, and unconditional support. I wanna thank you, Chair Traeger, for co-sponsoring these bills with me and for the opportunity to discuss these resolutions and to work collaboratively to create a more equitable future for our next generation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Lewis. Um, I'd now like to acknowledge that we've been joined by um, some additional council members. I see council member Ambry Samuel. Um, I think that's it for now. Oh, council member Cumbo, if I hadn't mentioned her before. Okay. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to senior policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, who will review some procedural items related to today's hearing and call the first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. My name is Chloe Rivera, and I am the Senior Policy Analyst to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a few second delay before you're unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Before I start with the protocols, I'd like to recognize that Councilmember Rodriguez has joined this hearing. Uh, the first panel will include representatives from the New York City Commission on Gender Equity and the New York City Department of Education, followed by Councilmember questions, then public testimony. In order of speaking, we have Jacqueline E. Banks, Executive Director of the New York City Commission on Gender Equity, Josh Wallach, Deputy, Deputy Chancellor for Early Childhood Education and Student Enrollment at the Department of Education, and Emmy Liss, Chief Operating Officer for the Division of Early Childhood Education and Department of Education. And here for question and answers, we also have Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner of Youth Services at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. I will now administer the oath of the administration. When you hear your name, Please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Director Ebanks? I do. Deputy Chancellor Wallach? I do. Chief Operating Officer Liss? Let's move on to Deputy Commissioner Haskell. I do. Sorry, I was not able to unmute. Oh, I mean, okay, thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Haskell, please. Waiting to unmute Deputy Commissioner Haskell. Sorry about that. I'm not sure we're having issues with unmuting Deputy Commissioner Haskell. All right, we will move on and uh, hopefully address that issue moving forward. Uh, we will now hear from Executive Director Ebanks. You may begin once a test. You, be you may begin your testimony once a member of our staff unmutes you. Good morning, Chairs Rosenthal and Traeger. 
and members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and the Committee on Education. I am Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director of New York City's Commission on Gender Equity, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Josh Wallach, Deputy Chancellor for Early Childhood Education and Student Enrollment at the Department of Education, and Susan Haskell, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Youth Services at the Department of Youth and Community Development. Before beginning my testimony, I'd like to acknowledge the partnership and leadership of Chair Rosenthal and, our, and Council Member Diana Ayala, both of whom serve on the Commission on Gender Equity. It has been a pleasure and honor to partner with you over the past few years. In my role as Executive Director of CGE, I also serve as an advisor to the Mayor and First Lady on policies and issues affecting gender equity in New York City for all girls, women, transgender, gender non-binary and gender non-conforming New Yorkers. Throughout the tenure of the de Blasio administration, we have been steadfast in our commitment to promote equity, excellence, and fairness for all New Yorkers. From providing free full-day pre-kindergarten to all four-year-olds and expanding this program to three-year-olds, to enshrining rights of pregnant and parenting New Yorkers, among other important efforts, this administration strives to ensure that all New Yorkers have opportunities to thrive regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or background. It is within this context that CGE works across city agencies to create deep and lasting institutional commitment to tearing down equity barriers within our city. CGE operates within three focus areas. They are economic mobility and opportunity, health and reproductive justice, and safety. We use a human rights framework and an intersectional gender lens to do our During my testimony, I will discuss the intersection of gender equity and childcare provision, and will highlight the work of the de Blasio administration in his doing to advance childcare access in New York City, particularly during these unprecedented times as the city, nation, and the globe wrestle with the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic reminds us yet again that economic inequities have disastrous effects on our health, safety, and overall well-being. This is clearly visible when we examine the unique challenges women have faced over the past eight plus months, both at home and at work, which have now become one and the same place because of the pandemic. As is now common knowledge, the industries most likely to employ women have been the ones most impacted by the, the pandemic. For example, the retail and hospitality industries which employ a high percentage of women have seen significant numbers of temporary and permanent business closures. Additionally, Women who already did most of the work at home are now working from home, taking care of children, overseeing remote learning, and continue to carry the majority share of household responsibilities. Simultaneously, the businesses which form the core of essential employers have remained open during the pandemic and employ a high percentage of women, particularly in the medical fields and at our supermarkets. Taken together, these conditions are unsustainable for women and families across our city. They have caused women to leave the workforce entirely if they're able, and they have resulted in what experts are calling a she session. Prior to the pandemic, as part of our commitment to putting an end to economic and social inequities, the de Blasio administration consistently focused on developing high quality and affordable childcare for all New Yorkers, regardless of their background or family income. As a result, in 2014, the administration launched the nation's most expansive increase of pre-K enrollment, known as Pre-K for All, which in its first year doubled the number of children previously enrolled. Building upon this success, in 2017, the administration launched its 3K for All program. 
both these new and expanded childcare programs complemented the city's already existing early, early learn childcare program, Head Start programs, childcare voucher programs, and CUNY childcare centers. Together, this gave us a network of programs that provide childcare and education services to eligible children from ages six weeks to five years old in a variety of setting, settings, be they home-based, center-based, or public schools. And finally, since 2014, this administration has advanced a number of policies and legislations, legislation that promotes New York City parents' ability to ad adequately care for their children in spite of life circumstances that may arise. Two such um, advancements are, in 2014, paid sick leave was expanded, expanded previous legislation to add grandparents, grandchildren, and siblings to the definition of family members, which workers can legally care for using paid sick time. And then in 2016, we increased paid parental leave by providing six weeks at 100% salary for maternity, paternity, adoption, or foster care leave, and up to 12 weeks fully paid when combined with existing leave with an expansion in 2018 that included public school teachers. What we recognize in this administration is, in, is that increasing the availability of high quality childcare and affordable childcare for all New York City's children and families is critically important and certainly so now more than ever. CGE focuses on this issue within its economic mobility and opportunity focus area where we seek to ensure that all New Yorkers can live economically secure lives and have access to opportunities to thrive. Consequently, we deepen our commitment to collaborate with our colleagues at DOE and DYCD and to work with community partners to ensure that we prioritize and meet the needs, the childcare needs of women and families during this pandemic and beyond. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I look forward to continued conversations on this issue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Before we move on to the next witness, I would like to recognize that we have been joined by council members Cornegie and Barron. Now, Deputy Chancellor Wallach, you may begin once a member of our staff unmutes you. Ah, thank you. Um, I think, can you hear me now? Great. Um, thank you, Executive Director Eubanks for your testimony. Good morning, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Traeger uh, and all the members of uh, the Committees on Women and Gender Equity and, and Education here today. Um, I'm Josh Wallach, Deputy Chancellor of the Division of Early Childhood and Student Enrollment at the New York City Department of Education. Um, I just wanna thank you for inviting us to testify today. Um, about how we're providing um, uh, childcare uh, in New York City during the pandemic. And for all the support uh, you provided us over the years um, uh, for uh, early care and education, um, which has been a priority for this administration. Um, uh, as, as we've already heard, uh, and just to, just to repeat, Mayor de Blasio has made access to free full day high quality 3K and pre-K for all, a top priority of this administration. And in partnership with teachers and leaders across the city and with your help and support, we've expanded access to these programs to tens of thousands of children, um, helping our youngest learners get a strong start in school and life. And as so many of you have pointed out even already, providing an essential support for working families. Um, just as, as you've indicated, access to early childhood programs is vital both for the success of children and the ability of mothers and all caregivers to participate in the workforce, continue their education and support themselves and their families. Um, and we also recognize that when we continue to make investments in our early childhood workforce as a city, 
we are in also investing in women and their families as the majority of early childhood program leaders, teachers, and staff are women, uh, including many women of color. Following the expansion of Pre-K for All in 2014 and 3K for All in 2017, we reached another milestone in 2019 with the transition of the Early Learn System of Contracted Early Care and Education uh, from the Administration for Children's Services to the Department of Education. Um, and now the Department of Education is very proud and honored to support an early childhood system that can serve nearly 100,000 children from birth to age five in, in settings that span district schools, um, Department of Education pre-K centers, community-based organizations, and uh, family child care homes. There is universal access for all four-year-olds in New York City and three-year-olds in nearly half of our school districts. Across the city, we provide Head Start and other extended day and year programs for families who are eligible based on their income and needs. And we work closely with family child care providers, particularly to meet the needs of infants and toddlers as well as three-year-olds. We know how important a longer day and year of care are for many families of young children. Um, and while our state and federal resources for these programs are limited, especially in this current fiscal climate, we do hope to expand these opportunities in the future um, in partnership with you. Since the onset of this pandemic, the city has made it our priority to ensure that families, including our healthcare professionals and other essential workers, could access safe, reliable care and education for their children. Toward this end, the efforts of teachers, leaders, and staff at our early childhood programs to support children and families during this time have been nothing short of extraordinary. As you know, the Department of Education's Regional Enrichment Centers, or RECs, were a critical support for the city's first responders and essential workers beginning in March when schools closed for in-person learning. As part of this effort, many of our community-based organizations and family child care programs also kept their doors open to provide emergency child care for children under five. Teachers, leaders, and staff in these programs volunteered to take on this heroic task at the height of fear and uncertainty in our city. And they not only ensured the health and safety of children and staff, but also created nurturing, welcoming environments for children and families when they needed it most. Simultaneously, the rest of our early childhood system shifted to remote instruction in the spring, helping children learn from home in the most creative ways, hosting virtual lessons, sharing recorded messages from teachers, making regular phone calls to check in with caregivers and offer tips for play-based learning, and much more. We know that this has been an incredibly challenging time for families uh, and acknowledge all the ways families have been adapting to this new environment and creating as much normalcy and support for their children as possible. I know I speak for everyone when I express my deep gratitude to early childhood programs for their leadership and service to New York City's communities through one of our most difficult moments. I also wanna recognize the tireless work of my colleagues at the Division of Early Childhood Education, from social workers offering trauma-informed support to instructional staff who eased the transition to remote learning, to policy support staff who developed and trained programs on new health and safety guidance, to those who stepped up to take on reassignment at our district schools, and so many more, this dedicated team has been so invested in ensuring the well being, safety, and success of our community based partners um, and the children and families they serve. And I thank them for this ongoing service to our city. A critical support we've provided um, for our contracted early childhood programs throughout the pandemic is uh, continuing to honor our contracts as programs shifted to offering remote instruction. We also worked with the Child Care Resource and Referral Consortium to ensure providers had access to CARES Act funding opportunities. And we have maintained the administration's commitment to salary parity for teachers in community-based organizations following a significant new agreement with our partners in labor uh, District Council 37, as well as the Head Start Sponsoring Board and the Daycare Council. We are currently in the second year of a three-year phase-in of these salary increases and remain on track to fulfill this commitment. We are continuing to work with our partners in state and federal government 
to maximize the resources available to our programs. And as we approached the fall, we knew how crucial it was for our students, especially our youngest and most vulnerable students, to be able to attend their schools and early childhood programs in person. For many families, the school or program community is one of the steadiest, most reliable aspects of their lives with people and resources they can count on. So many aspects of reopening schools and early childhood programs have been unprecedented, but the reality has remained the same. Our children need to learn in person with a caring teacher as often as possible. So this fall, we built on the valuable experience of emergency child care and family child care providers to inform our broader reopening efforts and the strong support systems we put in place for the school year. Health and safety has been our top priority from the outset, and we worked hand in hand with programs to keep staff, children, and families safe as we resumed in-person services that we know are such a vital support to families and communities. We have been encouraged by the very low positivity rate at schools and programs and we appreciate every effort programs have made to maintain the highest standard of safety while providing a caring learning environment for children. We have issued and provided training for programs on comprehensive health and safety guidance in partnership with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And we directly ship 30 day supplies of personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies to all our programs. We continue to support programs through our situation room through which we work with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene or DOHMH and the New York City Test and Trace Corps to confirm any positive cases and coordinate next steps. We are following the same protocols for close contact quarantine and site closure as we do in our public schools. And we're also pleased to offer nursing support to our contracted programs. Nurses are available through our telehealth hotline and visit programs to help guide their health and safety practices. And staff and children at all Department of Education, early childhood programs and affiliated family child care programs have priority access for COVID-19 testing at the city's testing locations. As we keep health and safety at the forefront of everything we do, we are also working with programs to ensure that children have an enriching educational experience that we know is key to their development. Our instructional experts have helped guide programs on supporting children's learning in remote and blended learning environments including uh, the use of technology for early learning, classroom design that maintains social distancing and sharing resources for families to use at home. We have also distributed devices to thousands of early childhood families and launched new family resources like Ready for K, which empowers families by texting them simple ways to incorporate learning into their day in multiple languages. All our guidance for programs has been delivered through frequent comprehensive communication that is really a cornerstone of our partnership with program leaders. We share updates, resources, and other important information with programs at least weekly through our Early Childhood Bulletin and through webinars, office hours, and virtual meetings. Throughout the school reopening process, our youngest learners and their families have been top of mind for in-person learning. During the recent temporary school closure, our community-based early childhood programs and family child care programs, again, continue to offer essential in-person services for children and families, and we continue to support them in maintaining safe, healthy environments for children and staff. Many of our contracted early childhood programs also act as partners in the city's Learning Bridges Initiative, a collaboration between DOE and the Department of Youth and Community Development that provides free childcare opportunities for children in 3K through eighth grade on days when they're scheduled to be remote. There are currently 450 Learning Bridges programs operating for children from 3K through eighth grade with the capacity to serve nearly 44,000 students. That number continues to increase as we expand seats across all five boroughs. As we open new programs, we reach out to any family that has applied and is still looking for a seat in that community and partner with school and program leaders in our community outreach efforts to encourage more families to apply. While we work to expand the program, Priority placement has been given to children of essential workers or families previously enrolled in a REC, Regional Enrichment Center, priorities to families in temporary housing, children of teachers and school staff, children in foster care, and students with disabilities. Learning Bridges programs remain open to serve children and families during temporary school closure, providing crucial childcare for working families. 
And in order to respond to feedback from families, we have also now added early drop-off hours at approximately 70 of our Learning Bridges and Learning Labs programs. And nearly 130 Learning Bridges sites are co-located with an after-school program that operates from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. DYCD funds nearly 1,100 after-school programs across the city as well. We are proud to partner with the early childhood programs that have been such resilient sources of support for their community through this public health crisis. I'm looking ahead. We're excited to continue our efforts to strengthen the city's early care and education sector for years to come. This summer, we significantly increased the city's investment in family childcare through our new family childcare network contracts, which include higher rates for providers, greater support for professional learning and family engagement, and the opportunity to offer 3K in family childcare homes for the first time. Next summer, we will reach another important milestone in our effort to create a stronger, more unified early care and education system when new center-based contracts begin. These contracts will contain pay parity for teachers, an enhanced funding model that accounts for more of programs fixed costs, and greater opportunities for socioeconomic and racial integration in classrooms. We continue to center the voices of providers and the families they serve in all the aspects of our work and recently began piloting a citywide council of community-based program leaders, starting with leaders in programs in the communities most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and we are looking forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Rosenthal for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that they have a question for the administration. Chair Rosenthal. Let's move to Chair Traeger while we wait for Chair Rosenthal to rejoin the hearing. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. And at, at any time the chair returns, I'll be happy to immediately pass uh, the microphone to her. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for, for, for your testimony. Um, I'll begin with a very basic, simple question and just would like to, to kind of hear an answer from the administration. Um, do you believe the city of New York is providing um, accurate coverage, adequate coverage for those who need childcare during the pandemic? Why or why not? I'll start. Um, um, I believe that we are, um, although we are constantly um, trying to improve, um, but I believe that we're, um, we're meeting the need at present. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. First of all, um, uh, we're lucky to partner with so many um, um, community-based organizations around the city that um, are providing right now um, uh, childcare services. Uh, to students uh, of all ages. Um, and unlike in the spring, um, they are continuing to operate uh, as we're navigating this pandemic with our support. Um, and we're able to provide health and safety support for them um, so that they're able to do so safely. And as I, I sort of indicated, um, we're, we're, because of that partnership, um, we've seen, uh, um, we've been able to operate those in a health and safe, in a, in a healthy and safe way. In addition to that, um, we have partnered with the Department of Youth and Community Development, um, again, with, with, with your guidance and support to stand up the Learning Bridges Program, which is a specific program really tailored to provide support to children and families that are engaged in blended learning when children cannot be in school buildings because of social distancing. And there, as I said, we, we have made, um, uh, we have created the capacity um, to serve tens of thousands of students um, and so far we placed 43,600 students on program rosters. Um, that is you know, three times the amount that we ever offered through the RECs. Um, and we've seen, uh, we're serving about um, right now, 90% of all the families, or we place them on a roster, 90% um, of, of all the priority families that have applied. So we are keeping up with the demand. Um, we are constantly adding new sites in order to um, respond to specific locations of the city um, where we may be a little bit slower than we like, but um, we are keeping up and uh, doing our best in partnership with children, families, and uh, organizations to meet this need. 
so I, I know that we've been uh, rejoined by uh, Chair Rosenthal. I'm just gonna have one quick follow-up and I'll, then I'll turn it over to, to the chair. Uh, Deputy Chancellor, what about uh, the painful stories that we've heard of children with autism uh, being turned away because the city is not able uh, to meet their needs in these programs? Um, and af after your answer, I'll be, I'll be happy to pass it over back to Chair Rosenthal. Um, we are committed um, to, to, to ensuring that students with disabilities get all the support um, and, and services to which they're entitled. And again, I think there's a few different answers to this. Um, first, um, uh, as we have reopened school buildings, um, we are prioritizing students with disabilities um, for live instruction. And we're very hopeful that we can continue our progress uh, to serving as many as possible. Um, um, five days a week in our school buildings. Um, in addition to that, um, we have now 10,000 students with um, IEPs um, on the rosters of Learning Bridges programs. Um, uh, because Learning Bridges are, is primarily a childcare program, we have not been able to replicate all the services that students receive when they're in DOE buildings, um, but that is exactly why we are giving priority um, to students with disabilities as we're bringing back students for live instruction. And as more schools move to five days a week, we're learning more about which students will go back uh, to their home schools full time and will adjust. Um, but we're, we're working on all fronts um, to meet the needs of these students and we share a goal with you in making sure that, that's, um, that, that that happens in every case. So, I mean, I wanna be respectful of Cheryl Rosenthal's time. So I do have follow-up, but I, I'm gonna turn it over to, over to the chair. Uh, no, um, please. Please, Chair Traeger, you keep going. You're on a roll, and I, I'm about to ask the next question you're about to ask. So, could you please continue, and I'll, I'll catch up while you're asking questions. So, I, I appreciate it, Chair. So, just very quickly, DYCD has previously told us that students in Learning Bridges are not able to access after-school programs on their non-school days. Deputy Chancellor, you pointed out that many after school programs are co-located with Learning Bridges. Are students in Learning Bridges now able to attend after school programs on their non-school days? Yeah, um, for, for that, I will, um, for, for the structure of after school programs, I will turn it over to my colleague from the Department of Youth and Community Development who's with us today. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to respond to your oath earlier and just say I do now that I'm successfully <laughs> unmuted and um, yeah, to continue. I think that may have been a miscommunication on our part. There's not a guarantee for an after school seat for a learning bridges participant or a learning lab participant in an after school seat, but um, absolutely many, if not the majority of learning lab students who are currently um, attending a lab that's co-located with an after school are continuing in the three to six period to get the full day coverage. Um, absolutely, they are eligible to apply separately to the after school program as many of them are and may, and get a full day access to program to uh, childcare. I'll pause here, but you know, I, I continue to point out that we still have issues and I don't think that we're meeting the need. And I think that kids who really need help and services are being, are the ones who what we keep hearing are being turned away because the need cannot be met. But with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Chair Rosenthal. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Traeger. I, I really, uh, I'm gonna to continue to ask questions, but I feel that we've, as I've listened to your questions and the answers, I feel we're getting the vaguest of answers. Um, you know, as we are, getting questions from our constituents and hearing stories and learning from advocates that, you know, children with disabilities uh, are not getting access, cannot access. And, and, you know, again, back to the impact on women, I mean, you know, in the most respectful way, I know your goal is to make sure that people have access to childcare, but it's not happening. 
Um, so to the extent you could be just super specific about wait lists and numbers and what you're doing to try to know what the wait list is. So you even know how many, you know, families need these services. Um, I don't know, it just it sure. helped convince me that it's not, you know, third or fourth level rung down on the priority poll. I'll, uh, um, I appreciate, um, I appreciate the, the you know, sort of reframing the question and I will, I'll do my best because it's absolutely a priority for us. Um, and we want to work with you um, to make sure we're, we're, we're living up to that uh, goal and commitment. Um, so as I said, I mean, um, just, to, just to be as specific as possible, um, we invited applications from all over the city. We set an initial goal um, and we said that we want to make sure that this administration is standing behind families and children during this pandemic and that in a year where many of our students would be in, in blended learning, um, we would provide um, a nurturing and safe place for them to be on the days where they could not be in school buildings um, because of social distancing requirements. And so we, we, we put an initial number out based on our estimate of what we thought demand would be, but we also said that we would be careful and thoughtful about standing up services and supports where we saw demand um, because of course resources are limited and we have yet to get support from, from the federal government for any of these efforts. Um, and so I'll, I'll just, just to say, I mean, this is the second big um, expansion of childcare that I've been a part of. And I think we always try to be led by where we're seeing demand. So um, what we've seen so far is um, about, is we have seen roughly 50,000, 50,600 eligible families apply. Um, and we now have 43,600 students on program rosters. So we are, we currently have, um, we've, we've been able to put 80% of all applicants um, on a roster and 90% of the families that meet one of the priority groups that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we are working every day to get those numbers up to 100%. And our goal is to make an offer to every family um, that's, that's applied to us, that's eligible by the end of this calendar year. And we're on track to do that. So I wanna reframe a little bit and say that our goal is not, is, um, is not uh, it is about meeting the demand um, and, and specifically making sure that we're offering a slot um, to every family that needs it. Um, that's really the way I would frame the goal and we are on track um, to meet that. Since we last spoke uh, to this committee, um, we have added 4,000 slots just in those la in those last few weeks, and we've made 4,000 um, more offers. Um, so the other complexity I think here, and then I'll 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 stop and just make sure, see if this m meets the specificity, is this shift that we've been able to make now to um, since now that we have a better sense of which how many students um, want to come back for live instruction versus remaining remote. Um, the mayor and chancellor have. Uh, put forward the call to um, uh, offer in-person instruction five days a week for as many students as possible. And primarily, of course, prioritizing the same groups that we just mentioned that are priority for learning bridges. And so that has put us in the happy position of shifting again, um, because we may be able to actually put more of our um, students that are taking advantage of learning bridges into their home school buildings five days a week opening up more opportunities for students that might still be in blended or need additional care. So we're shifting as we go. But I think the, the bottom line is we have, and this sort of uh, just goes to, goes to the, 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 uh, the statement I made earlier, we are um, meeting uh, the demand um, uh, and we're on track to meet it completely by the end of the calendar year. Um, and we're putting a special emphasis on the children and families um, that need this care the most that are part of the priority groups. Um, and and uh, we still have work to do, but with your help, we'll, we'll, we'll achieve the goal. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's interesting thinking about from last hearing to this hearing, and I appreciate all the work that you've done and the speed and, and also, frankly, the challenges, right? So one, I, I'm 
I'm on the Department of Education website, I think, and I think I'm looking at uh, the link to sites that are now available. Um, and I'm noticing a couple of changes. One is that there's not a drop down menu anymore. It's just there's a Google sheet with every single site on there. It, am I looking at the right thing? I, um, I believe so. Yes, the, okay. we've made the complete list of sites public. Yes, right, right. But and that's great. I mean, a couple of things jump out at me. One is that it looks like every single location has seats available except for five. Do you think like how often are you is that up to date? I mean, is that true? We are making and offers. What does that yeah. mean to you that so many seats are available. Say that last part. I just I, we were both talking at the same time. I couldn't hear. And I should have let you talk. So you go ahead. I apologize. No, no, not at all. I just couldn't hear the question. I, I, I guess I would just say quickly, um, the, the sheet is updated weekly. Okay. Um, so um, there are, you know, the, 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 the information may be a couple of days out of date, but it shouldn't be more than that. I mean, I, you know, it's funny what, you know, data, they, there's all those jokes about statisticians and how they never come to the same conclusion. Now I'm looking at the data and saying, well, why are there so many empty seats? Are, are, have parents given up and they're not, you know, coming back? They don't realize now seats are available. Um, that's sort of one question. It doesn't really need to be answered. It's just, you know, how do, what do we make sense of this data? But the other thing, if we could just think about improvements for one nanosecond, sure. um, I see there's a column for whether or not there's early drop off available. That's great. I think another column should be whether or not they serve kids with disabilities and any sort of specificity there, I think would be helpful because otherwise parents are going to have to call through this list and call everyone. Um, and then lastly, well, not lastly, sorry, I think you have a problem with, uh, with languages, right? Mm. It's all in English. And I think that is a major glaring problem. And then honestly, I think a lot of people like me think visually, see visually. And so I think maps would be helpful. Like somehow if you could put in, you know, and I don't know, you know, some sort of map so you could see, you know, I live here and the closest one is you know, a mile away, and this is the name of it, you know, so sort of a combination of those things, I think would be really helpful. And with that, I am going to turn it back to the moderator. I know people have been waiting to ask questions and really appreciate all my colleagues and everyone here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to turn it to Councilmember Lewis for questions. Not yet. Oh, apologies. So we will turn to council member. I stopped abruptly. So with apologies, sorry. Can we turn to council member Kalos, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I please hold. Let, let's talk about that transparency. The city council passes a lot of reporting bills and there's a lot of reports out there. Uh, and even as a council member, I've had difficulty getting my hands on those reports. And I found that when things are public, that means that I as an elected official might have access to. And uh, you, you might be surprised to all the nooks and crannies that reports can be hidden in. And so uh, my feeling is you get what you measure uh, there's an observer effect. Apologies for that. Uh, I will first, Oops. if council Oops. members have questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Okay. Uh, I, I think council member Kalos may not know he's been muted. He's still speaking. I think. 
Councilmember Kalos is um, currently attending another hearing. Ah, okay, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I had the same question. So uh, please remember to keep questions and answers to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will maintain a clock and a member of our staff will unmute you. You may begin after I call you and the Sergeant gives you the cue. We will hear questions from Council Member Kalos and Council Member Rose. First, we can hear from Council Member Kalos if he is available, or Council Member Rose, I'm sorry. My apologies. Hi, um, thank oh. you. It's, it's a very busy day um, today uh, in terms of hearings. I wanna thank both chairs for, um, for even convening this hearing. Um, there's been um, a lot of issues um, around uh, enrollment versus um, actual attendance. So mm -hmm. I'd like to know, do you find that enrollment in learning bridges and learning lab programs often exceeds the number of children or youth who actually attend the programs daily? And if so, do the costs for running these programs remain constant regardless of how many children or youth, or youth attend the programs? And how are we ensuring that the providers will be compensated the full amount of their FY21 um, contracts? Um, and will DOE or DYCD compensate learning bridges and learning lab providers the full amount of their FY21 contracts regardless of daily attendance at these programs? And when should they expect to be compensated and reimbursed? Thanks. Uh, I'll start and, and then turn to uh, my colleagues if they want to add anything. Um, so no, what we find is actually um, uh, that families use the, the service at whatever they, as they need it. Um, and as we saw with the regional enrichment centers over the spring um, and early summer, that tends to vary, uh, you know, as a family needs care throughout the week. Um, um, and so, uh, but um, we understand that it's critical that our providers have a, a stable source of funding and understand how they can plan their program um, regardless of that varying need. We're, we're in a crisis and we have to stand up the service and meet the... Um, and earlier this fall, um, DOE and DYCD recently informed the providers that they can expand their services that they offer to other schools beyond the families completed. as they come. Oh, I'm sorry. I um, thought you had no, finished. Oh, no, I just didn't. Uh, no, that's fine. I, I was just going to note that um, you're right to say that that um, we did offer the, the opportunity to expand. I think I froze is what happened, My, um, so sorry. Um, I was going to say that programs are allowed to charge um, against their total expenses. They do not pay by by enrollment or attendance. And that was in order to provide that stability. Sorry, sorry, Council Member, go ahead. Oh, oh no, I'm Tech so issues. sorry. I, I'm really sorry. I'm having tech issues myself. Earlier this fall, DYCD and DOE um, informed the providers that they could expand their services beyond the feeder schools. Does this policy complicate keeping everyone under the same protocols? Um, if these providers extend you know, the net to keep their enrollment up and um, doesn't, does this shift the reliability and burden to the providers to ensure that the protocol is followed? And how is DOE supporting these providers and the process? Will there be additional guidance for this support? And, and, and just um, to finish off, because my time's almost up, yeah. is, um, uh, what are the cleaning and disinfecting guidelines for these providers and, um, and who, who assumes the extra cost um, to keep up the regular deep cleaning? Thank you for that. Um, I'll say a few things in response. Um, so first of all, um, we consulted very carefully with the administration's public health experts before making that shift. Um, we did it in order to meet the needs of families for care, but we would not have done it if we did not, um, uh, if, they, if our experts did not tell us that we could do so it, it safely um, and in and, and, and protecting the staff and the children and families in those programs. Um, those programs are part of the same health and safety operation as our district schools. Um, any positive cases that come in go through um, our situation room 
We have seen very low positivity rates um, in our Learning Bridges programs, um, thankfully. Um, uh, they follow the detailed health and safety protocols that we helped, um, that, that our, our health experts put together. We provided that training and support to all our providers. And I can send you a copy of it if you'd like to look at it. Um, but I think if uh, uh, we've been very successful in working with our partners um, to get that out um, to providers as they need it. Um, How are we handling the disparate um, treatment in terms of um, uh, districts that find themselves um, uh, orange, like uh, they become uh, rated orange, um, but the protocols are somewhat different in different um, districts and they might both be an orange district. Yes. In all the districts, um, um, we are continuing to provide um, care and education to our students as an essential service. Um, and we, again, consulting with our public health experts, have put protocols into place, including, as you alluded to, providing um, protective equipment, providing health and safety training, providing nursing support, the support of our situation room, um, and training for all the staff in how to um, maintain healthy and safe, socially distant environments. Um, and all those protocols together have allowed us to provide care um, regardless of the zone color. Um, it's the same level of precaution in every area. Um, and we know that we can provide it with our partners um, quality care in a safe and healthy way um, as we navigate the, uh, through this pandemic. Who assumes the cost for the additional deep cleaning um, uh, for programs, for uh, learning lab programs? Um, is the provider um, responsible for that? Or is that, um, especially providers that are in schools, or, or is DOE responsible for that? Um, we work with our providers on that. We provide the personal protective equipment um, and we work through um, we, we add to their budget um, whatever supplies that, you know, funding for whatever supplies they need um, to follow those protocols. So we're responsible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Thank you. We will now turn to Councilmember Kalos. Uh, thank you. I want to thank the administration. I want to thank uh, DYCD DOE for standing up learning bridges on uh, a quick timeline. It was something I was advocating for along with council member Lander and many others. Uh, I know that the initial goal was 100,000 and that I was pushing for 500,000. I think we started at several thousand, but never. I, how many learning bridges seats are we up to right now? Yeah, so the right now um, we are up to a um, uh, 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 44, we have capacity for 44,000 students across 450 sites. Um, we are- 22,000 slots or- Yes. Okay. We have, we have 44,000, we have capacity for 44,000. We have 43,600 on program rosters. And we've seen about 50,600 eligible applications. So again, as I was, I know you're going back and forth between hearings, but I just want to reiterate for others as well. I think that our goal is to, of course, to, is to meet the demand for care. And so, and so we set a goal originally, um, but what we've seen is about 51,000 families that need care and we're providing um, space on the rosters for about 80% of the total families that applied and 90% of the priority families. And we're adding more seats every week. So our goal is to make an offer by the end of the year to every family that needs it. Great. On that note, I do want to thank folks for working with us when uh, the school year started. We only had one location serving uh, 60 total children. We now have another location with 200 additional children. I, I will just share a little bit of frustration. Uh, previously, when we have worked with DOE to bring pre-K seats and find a vendor and they passed all their requirements, we were able to bring them on and on Roosevelt Island, we were working with one vendor, did not know about a second vendor. And uh, um, then the city came with the good news that we're getting 200 slots, but then the vendor we had been working with the whole time, and even our office and a lot of parents felt like the rug got pulled under them. It's hard to be angry when you got what you asked for, but 
when we are working with these vendors, um, it, it would be helpful if we could be more honest and also even to the extent that um, they may have different services, uh, even see if we can bring them on along those lines. Uh, I've reached out to a lot of providers and um, what we had when we worked together on pre-K was um, that the city could come in and uh, open spaces uh, for that. And um, when I've got to providers, they're just like, how long is this contract? Do you mean to tell me I'm gonna sign a lease and open this and it's a seven month or six month contract and I don't know how many folks or things like that. Um, I found buildings who are willing to operate. Uh, is there an opportunity to, um, is there an opportunity for, for DOE to come in and, and do at least the, the learning centers, the spaces with the computers, uh, particularly in, in low income communities of color where there is a still a digital divide and children still don't have devices uh, because it, it's very hard to make a case for a provider to go through all the process for a, a six month uh, contract. And I, and I don't know real, real estate developers and, and landlords who are willing to do the six month contract. They do a six month contract with you, but it gets more complicated when you bring in a nonprofit provider. Yes, thank you for that. Um, we are still, you know, we're still at, trying to identify additional partners that can work with us and our request for information, which is the way we're gathering um, information about this, um, is still live and will be through January. Um, you're, you're pointing out a legitimate challenge, which is um, trying to find, you know, uh, spaces and partners um, um, throughout the city. And you're right to say, like, it's, it's uh, the additional challenge of trying to mount a sort of crisis response um, doesn't always match with the needs of landlords for long term stability. So we're trying to be creative. We would love to work with you and others um, and specific providers to try to work something out. I can't say we'll be able to do it in every case, but we'll put our best uh, our best effort forward um, to try to make that work. Deputy Chancellor, I can tell you firsthand, because this is one of the few days I'm in the office just so that my daughter can have the living room today uh, and because I have multiple hearings, but like this pandemic is really hard on parents and um, especially we're on the east side, one bedroom, whole family, My it, it's she, she's bouncing off walls. We we needed pre-K, we got that done. We need 3K from the tip of Manhattan to, to central Harlem. We don't have it. Um, I think we need it more today than we did before the pandemic. How do we get, how do we start rolling out these contracts? And is there a way for us to say, you know what, you can start as learning bridges, particularly if you're serving lower age kids, and then we'll roll you into a 3K contract. Um, yeah. three, I, I, I think 3K is part of the equation and learning bridges can supplement it, but we don't even have it right now. Thank you for that. And, and I think um, I think what I would say is uh, obviously this administration, first of all, we appreciate the sense of urgency. We feel it as well. Um, and uh, we wanna work with you to, to mount this effort as quickly as we possibly can as we have. I'm, I'm I think you're right to- My daughter is falling behind socially. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I don't know, there's nothing just, you know, like uh, we're, we're with you and, and so many other families are expressing their concern as well. And, and we're, um, we wanna partner with, with them and with community-based organizations to help respond. I think that um, you're right to say part of the answer here is the city building on the uh, commitment that this administration has made with your help to creating a comprehensive uh, system of supports for uh, young children and families. It appears uh, Deputy Chancellor's screen has frozen. Council Member Kalos, do you mind if we move on? Uh, when, when the deputy chancellor reconnects, if he could finish the question, uh, it looks like he just reconnected and is waving his hand, but I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Let's unmute the deputy chancellor. 
Hi, sorry about that. Pandemic times, um, tech issues. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, so as I was saying, um, I, I think we are we are we feel the same sense of urgency. We want to work um, to try to respond in any way we can. Um, and I think part of this is um, long-term support from our federal and state partners to build out the sort of comprehensive um, and consistent set of systems and supports that we need for our youngest learners and their families. And look forward to partnering with you as we have before, Councilmember Kalos, to, to make that true. Thank you. We will now move to Chair Rosenthal. I mean, I'm sorry, Chair Traeger. Thank you very much. Um, I just, I wanna go back a little bit uh, to earlier questions. Um, Deputy Chancellor, can you repeat again, just for the record and just uh, for clarity, the number of, of children signed up for the, all the learning bridges? Was, was it 44,000, is that what I heard? We have 44,000 students that have been put on program rosters. So what that means is they've been offered a spot um, the, and the program and the family are in touch with one another um, and the family knows they have care available. The actual sort of, you know, enrollment and attendance again fluctuates depending on the family's need. Um, and of, of that number, how many are children with IEPs? Um, so at present, um, I'm just trying to pull up the number now because I'm having these tech issues. Hold on one second. 10,000 are students with disabilities. And you mentioned earlier, I think to Chair Rosenthal, that the education department in the city is you know, trying to shift to uh, five days a week in person for some of our most vulnerable kids. Um, can you say with certainty that all District 75 sites are offering five days a week in person right now? Right now, um, uh, so ju just to be clear, I, I cannot verify that all of them are, we're working on it now. Uh, as of right now, um, um, there are uh, uh, about 250 schools that are offering um, five day a week instruction to all or, or, or all the priority students in their, in their buildings. There are 12,500 District 75 students currently in blended learning. 3,250 students are receiving five days of in-person instruction as of today. And another 6,900 students will be receiving five days of live instruction as of January 4th. And just for the record, um, how many children in New York City um, have an IEP? Sorry, Chair Traeger, I'm still having tech trouble, but I'm getting that for you now. Can we move on and I'll come back to that in just a moment? Yeah, I, I'm fairly certain the number is over 200,000. It's somewhere, somewhere in that range. So I, I, you know, I am not certain that we're, we are meeting the need um, by the numbers that I'm hearing now. And also um, a number of, you know, there are, is an accurate deputy chancellor that there are children with IEPs who do not go to District 75, but still have high needs, is that correct? Certainly that's true. And, and that is why we are making it a priority to reopen our school buildings that serve those students and to bring as many of those students back for five day a week instruction as possible. Um, so we're, we're, we understand the urgency of that and are working to make that true as quickly as possible. But currently, it is in fact the case that not all children with IEPs in New York City school system are being offered five days a week in person. Is that correct? Um, at this moment, uh, that is correct. Um, is there now a process for families and programs to request and the city to approve accommodations and supports needed for certain students with disabilities to participate in learning bridges what is the process and can the DOE post this process online by the end of the week? Can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question, Chair Traeger? Sure. Is there now a process for families and programs to request and the city to approve 
accommodations and supports needed for certain students with disabilities to participate in learning bridges? What is the process if there is one? And can the DOE post this process online by the end of the week? Thanks, I got it now. Um, so um, no family should be turned away from a learning bridges site, first and foremost. Um, and we've been working with families and programs to support student needs. So um, any family that um, is having trouble accessing a learning bridges program um, and needs additional support um, should get in touch with us. And we're constantly reaching out to programs as well to make sure they don't need additional support. And we will work with their program to make sure that the student can be supported. Um, each of our teams, uh, all the agencies that you see here, um, have point people that can respond to any concerns. And we've added this um, to all of our offer letters. So when a family gets an offer to Learning Bridges, they get, you know, they hear from us that if there's if the student needs additional support, they can come to us and we will provide it. Um, so we're trying to be transparent about that. Um, and we will continue to put that through all of our channels as well. We appreciate your, your suggestion. Um, I would appreciate that because I think there is still a lot of, there's a lack of clarity on this and there's, an, uh, there's just been an uneven application in terms, of, in terms of access. And I think that that needs to be revisited. Um, has the city opened any programs with smaller group sizes? Um, we have, uh, we are working with our providers um, um, in order to accommodate these students, but for that specific question, I, I wonder if I can just turn quickly to Susan from uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Haskell. Can we unmute Hi. her? Yes, yes, I'm unmuted. Um, we right now all are all of the learning lab programs are funded at the same level for the same level of staffing. Um, the learning lab programs we acknowledge don't have the full range of resources that are available through special education supports in the school day. Um, there are some there are many providers. I mean, as you point out, there are many students in the system who have IEPs. Um, some subset of that is uh, enrolled in blended learning and a subset of that has expressed interest in a learning lab. Uh, many, many young people with IEPs and students with disabilities are currently being served in our Learning Bridges programs, absolutely. At the same time, um, there are students who have been brought to our attention who, um, for matters of health and safety, uh, have there have been some barriers to participation in a learning lab. We have, um, as the Deputy Chancellor mentioned, we have a contact for families and for providers in those situations. And we've taken sort of a case management approach with um, between DYCD and DOE. We've had some success um, moving some of those students to five days a week um, where we were not able to make accommodation. The child childcare programs have some limitations, for example, around um, distribution of medication or um, other uh, elements that might be required for a young person to attend a learning bridges and we continue to um, try to address those needs. We are absolutely going to continue to work and make sure we find um, a, a resource for each young person. Right. And just to be clear, the majority of our schools are not offering five days a week because they can't because we still have staffing issues and other issues which, quite frankly, the administration has not been transparent about. Um, I have asked repeatedly about staffing at schools and I still have not been given that information. Um, and I also wanna note for the record that there are families in New York City with plenty of money that are paying for five days a week services for their children. But many of our families don't have the means to do that. So there really is a tale of two school systems really happening literally at the same time. And many of our children are falling behind no fault of their own. And that also is disproportionately impacting and hurting uh, working families and many low-income families in the city of New York. Um, can anyone tell me, has the city provided any student with a paraprofessional at a Learning Bridges program? I'll start. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'll start and then others can jump in. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, we're not able to provide uh, um, uh, just because of the uh, the details of, of, of agreements with our employees, we're not able to 
um, provide paraprofessional services at Learning Bridges programs. Um, and so again, we're, we are um, working to bring back students um, into district schools, um, you know, exactly for this reason. Some programs have been able to, to work with students using their current staff um, to give small group and one-on-one -on -one support, um, but we have not been able to provide that service. So this is where, again, I think the city falls short in terms of the equity test, because there's a big difference in terms of equality and equity. And equity is meeting the needs. And if a child has an IEP that requires one-to-one -one or certain attention, and they're not getting that, then that's really not um, meeting their needs. Um, and that is why we continuously hear from many parents, families, and advocates uh, to these barriers where actually kids are regressing. Um, I also want to note for the record that, um, you know, we, we hear, you know, if, if there are schools that are, let's say, open a day or one or two days a week, and if there's multiple cases in a school, uh, the school will be ordered to, to close, to, to shut down. Um, and parents still have to feel the brunt of that. And children, particularly kid, many children who rely on school as a sense of stability, they feel the brunt of that. Uh, this is continued disruption and interruption. Um, I'm curious to know, has the DOE or DYCD requested funding for the purpose of supporting students with disabilities and learning bridges programs from OMB, from City Hall, and what has been the response? Because clearly the need is there. The question is, has DOE and DYCD requested funding to OMB, to uh, City Hall? I'll just, I'll start. I, I'll say that, um, uh, OMB and City Hall, I mean, we as a city are, are unified in our, um, in our approach here in trying to provide the services and supports that children and families need during this time. Um, and so the mayor, the chancellor, all, you know, OMB, all down the line have been very clear um, that um, the resources, of, we will find a way uh, to support children and families. And that's why we've been able to stand up these services so quickly. Um, and they are working with us uh, to try to ensure that we're meeting the needs with students with disabilities as well. Um, I don't, Deputy Commissioner Haskell, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, I agree with that statement 100%. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we've been assessing the situation, taking a case management approach. Part of that has been engaging in some dialogue with our providers to say, you know, what is possible within the limitations of the child care regulations to do more um, to what funding would be necessary to add staff so that if you had a young person who could essentially you know work independently but needs you know also needs constant redirection maybe a one-on-one -on -one staff person which the typical learning lab is really not funded for um so we're we've begun some conversations about that and we're going to continue as i said to look at all options about how we can meet the need um for for all applicants um, I, I, I'm sensing that I think there's recognition that there's increased need. What I'm not hearing is what has been the response by those with the power to make a decision to apply more resources where clearly there is needed. Um, I, I would echo what the de deputy chancellor said to say that we are aligned in our interest to meet the, the students of needs, that the city is fully, you know, all agencies on board looking for the best way to meet the need. It's been a, it's been a cooperative process. So respectfully, I, I, I know, I feel, and I believe you, I think folks at DYCD and there are folks at DOE that believe in this and are aligned. I, I can't say with certainty that leaders at City Hall are, because if, if they were, we would not be hearing continuously how many kids are still turned away, families still struggling. You've just acknowledged that there are kids not being assigned paraprofessionals. You just acknowledge that there are kids not getting five days a week services. So clearly there's not, uniform alignment across city government. Let me just ask, I'll just, of I'll, 40, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to, to stop, to, to, to add in. I think, yeah. um, I, 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 I also just wanna emphasize that this is, um, as we said in the last hearing, this is a, a, a piece that we are all working actively on right now and trying to make improvements on as we speak. Um, so 
we are we are doing our you know, we're doing our best, and City Hall and OMB are working with us to improve this. Um, and so we will keep you posted as we continue to hopefully make progress on this point. I just wanted to make that I wanted to underscore that. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. De Deputy Chancellor, of the forty-four thousand kids enrolled in the program, um, how many are students in temporary housing? I'm still. Ah, here we go. Sorry, my my tech is really uh, challenging me. So right now we have two thousand students um, that are uh, in shelter, temporary housing, um, that are on the rosters for Learning Bridges programs. Um, Six hundred students in shelter have actually accepted our offer and are and are attending at the moment. And just for the record, how many children in New York City schools are students in temporary housing? Um, uh, you know. It, it, it depends on your definition, whether you're counting students in shelter. Um, I, I can oh. give you, there, there yeah. Um, about 100,000 are in some form of temporary housing. Um, over over 100,000 students, yeah. And you said 2,000 students are currently enrolled, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and let me just say, I think uh, we have been doing massive amounts of outreach into shelters, to families, through staff and directly to families to let them know about learning bridges. Um, I think that what this indicates is that, again, we are making it a priority to bring students in temporary housing back into district schools for live instruction. Um, and so I think we, we believe, um, and have good reason to believe that many of those students are being served um, in, in district schools. Um, uh, we, we have 24,000 students um, uh, students in temporary housing that are signed up for blended learning. So we know a good number of them are being served that way. And then we are reaching out to the others to make sure that they have the coverage they need um, and are also reaching into shelters to make sure that students have, you know, the devices and support they need to engage in remote learning um, from those facilities. So Deputy Chancellor, just again to reemphasize the point, um, we have how many total school buildings in New York City? Uh, at last count, I believe it's close to a thousand. We have, I think, even more than a thousand school buildings in New York City. Um, how many schools are um, offering five days a week in person at this time? At this moment, two hundred, roughly two hundred and fifty. Right. So, well under, just about maybe well under half, maybe a quarter or so of, of our schools are offering five days a week uh, in person. Um, kids have kids need to be somewhere, get services, get help. The numbers we're hearing today, I think are very concerning, alarming and chilling. I don't think we're truly meeting the need. I do believe that there are good folks at DOE and DYCD that care deeply about this work and believe in this work, but I don't think that they're, they're given the resources they need to really do this in an equitable and fair way. Um, I also wanna just raise something that really, really also disturbs me. Um, I have heard from uh, a number of educators through wellness calls, which they conduct, that their children, their students are asking them for hot meals. And when I have met with providers about this issue as well, not just at DOE sites, but at community-based organization sites, I am being told that there are major challenges in terms of food in terms of access to hot food, hot meals. Can you tell me how many sites that you know of now offer hot meals to New York City children? Um, so I'll say that just, um, uh, we started providing hot meals uh, this week for students that are in person for live instruction when they're in school buildings. So that is, that is something that we, we, we did start this week. Um, there are, as you, as you indicated, operational challenges with providing hot meals, um, such as like the time uh, and temperature, uh, mo sort of monitoring food safety to make sure that we're able to um, provide, um, you know, provide food in a healthy and safe way. Um, so our, our grab and go meals are not able to provide hot food. But all, every meal that we provide um, at all of our sites uh, meets or exceeds our, our nutritional standards, and we stand behind it. Are all schools, you just said that schools are starting hot meals this week. This is news to me. I mean, I have asked for a hot meals plan, and I'm, 
I was told that one was in the works, but we, we got no update on that. Um, can you say with certainty that all schools and all zip codes are offering these hot meals? I want to I want to get back to you on that because I don't have a number in front of me and I don't want to say a number um, uh, uh, without confirming it. Um, so I'll come back to you with specifics as it is new this week and there may be like a phased implementation or a rollout plan. So we'll come back to you on that. And Deputy Chancellor, do you have any reaction to um, stories we're hearing from our teachers where they felt it was important enough to share with me that a number of their students were asking for a hot meal because they haven't had one in a long time and they're asking for hot pizza and their school principal wanted to know if they could use school money to order them pizza and they were told they couldn't. Um, and so they were asking, what can we do as city policymakers to just push for kids to have a hot meal? Do you have any reaction to that? I mean, our reaction to it is that I think that is exactly why we've made this a priority and started to provide hot meals. Um, um, we, you know, again, I think we are all struggling to navigate our way through this pandemic. Um, and uh, so many people throughout our system with your support are doing everything they can to make it work. I think that um, we're trying to respond to that need. I'll come back to you shortly with a, the sort of implementation plan for it. But the good news is we were able to make progress and provide hot meals for students that are in for live instruction um, in our school buildings. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I stand corrected. We have about 1600 separate buildings for schools um, and we're trying to get them uh, sort of up and running um, as many that are open for live instruction. We're trying to get those kitchens up and running and I'll come back to you with a sort of phase plan for that. Right, and the access to hot meals, is that being also provided to community-based organizations so they can give children in their programs hot meals? I mean, I just wanna note for the record. Yeah, no, uh, unfortunately, no. Um, um, so they are, because they're not at DOE schools and DOE kitchens, um, again, the, the, the factor there is being able to deliver um, temperature controlled meals um, so that they're, we can ensure that they're safe and healthy to the 450 sites um, that we're sort of standing up as we go. So we have not, um, we are not able to provide hot meals to those sites at that time. We provide grab and go meals that are cold. They meet our nutritional standards. Um, and we'll continue to work on this aspect of our plans as we move through the coming months. And I hear that it's a priority for you as it is for many families and communities. So we'll continue to update you as, as we go. So I'm very mindful and respectful of temperature controls and rules. And I, I, of course, want to always prioritize safety, but how is it the city of New York finds a way to do it for seniors through with community-based partners for Meals on Wheels programs and others where they do get delivered a warm meal? And why is this a challenge for children at, at, with providers? Um, I, it, has been a, uh, it has been a challenge for us uh, essentially, it's part of starting up a, a new effort. Um, and uh, it's the logistics of, again, moving meals from the DOE kitchens, which themselves are providing hot meals now um, this week for the first time, moving from those food facilities out to Learning Bridges sites uh, and the logistics of standing up that operation. Um, so I know that that um, can sound like a, a sort of bureaucratic operational answer, but believe me, behind it is the commitment to make sure that our children have um, good nutrition uh, as they move through their day so that they can engage in the learning and other activities. We share that sense of urgency, we share the goal, and um, I, I really am committed to you as long with the rest of the agency and coming back to you and sort of reporting on our progress there. Just sharing for the record that from feedback I've heard from providers and, you know, at times kids are just offered a partially frozen sandwich. Uh, one, one provider said that because of delivery issues one day that they were only offer, able to offer kids a slice of bread. And I, I do think that this, this matters. And the fact that teachers are hearing about it um, and sharing it with me um, it tells me that, that this is a bigger issue um, than, than folks are letting on. But I'm going to turn back to we, my chair. We have not heard those, those accounts, but if you will, if you can share, and, and this is just in the interest of solving those problems. Oh, we did. We, we want to know about that so we can fix it. 
for sure. We, we, we did with your team, but we, we, we will circle back. And that's why we asked for a hot meals plan. Um, but I want to turn Thank it you. over to my co-chair, uh, Chair Rosenbaum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chair Traeger, for those in, insightful questions and helping to move the ball farther along as we all try to take care of our city's kids. Um, really appreciate you. And I mean, let me just start with a very broad question, um, sort of following up on Chair Traeger's questions. Um, and that is, could you, and, and here I'm gonna ask you for specifics and details. Lessons learned um, about the future of childcare as we plan for a fully restored economy. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I, 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 um, I, I, will, I will just say, um, a few different things about that. As we as we aim for a fully restored economy, I think that um, this administration agrees with the sentiments that you expressed and Chair Traeger expressed at the outset of the hearing that um, comprehensive um, supports for children and families, including affordable childcare, are absolutely critical um, for restoring the economy and a just economy, um, an equitable economy, and making sure that everyone can participate in it. Um, I think we are quite, uh, I won't go on too long, but I'll just say, I think we're quite encouraged by the incoming federal administration's commitment. Um, I don't know whether that means I should stop. Thank you. Sorry, keep going. Just oh, not at all. The incoming yeah. federal yeah. administration, we're all having, you know, uh, the incoming federal administration's commitment to affordable childcare has been, you know, heartening. Um, and their view that you know, uh, comprehensive childcare uh, from birth to age three and beyond um, should be in the reach of every family um, and that none of them should pay more than 7% of their income through a variety of means coupled with universal preschool. Um, I, think, I think we need, I'll just say, I think we've always said, and the mayor said this from the, from the moment that he launched 3K, we need the support of our other partners in government to make this city's vision for an equitable um, um, early care and education system and childcare system in general to, to, to be real. And I think we're, we're hopeful now that, there, that we see this on the horizon. We'll all have to work for it together. That's, that's the vision. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I think in some what you're saying is we don't have the funds for it. That's, that's, that's the short version, yes. If we had the funds, what would be your top priority? I think what the, the, the as the mayor and chancellor have, have pointed out, um, and, and I'll turn it to uh, Deputy Commissioner Haskell in a moment for school-aged childcare, because I think that that's critically important as well. Um, but from my perspective at the Department of Education, um, the mayor and chancellor have spelled out a vision for free full day, high quality, um, um, pre-kindergarten for all three-year-olds to come along. And as Councilmember Kahlo has pointed out, that is a cornerstone also of a, a, a fair and comprehensive early childhood system for all New Yorkers is to have 3K for all to complement pre-K for all. And in addition to that, I think we need to continue to invest in our family childcare homes around the city um, where we have a set of um, fantastic educators and entrepreneurs that already are the centerpiece of care for infants and toddlers in New York City. Um, and we as an administration have committed to increasing the rates for those providers and providing them with the professional development and support that they need to expand their services. Um, that is also a critical part of what it means to have a, a, an equitable and comprehensive early care and education system. It needs to be from birth through age five um, for early care and education. And then beyond that, for school age, I'll turn it over to, to Deputy Commissioner Haskell. Yeah, I'll just add. Sorry, can I just jump in for one quick second? Um, you know, Chance Deputy Chancellor, you mentioned a really important point, which is adequate payment. And I need to uh, take this moment to point out to you that 
while the city has said it will cover the cost of the indirect rate, stay with me, it's an important overhead component of what child care providers, part of their work. It's kind of like saying to city government, we're gonna pay for all the agencies, but there's no mayor's office. There's no OMB, there's no DOI, there's no law department, right? So right now the city has capped that indirect rate, not the, the Department of Education, has capped that indirect rate at 10%. Mm. And while, uh, despite the fact that they've reneged on their promise, while the city has said that they will increase the indirect rate for human service sector providers, they have, there are many that are providing services with like a 17% indirect rate. Again, simply the cost of the mayor's office, um, but they're not getting reimbursed for that. So as you look at full reimbursement, um, providers are asking me to remind you that the indirect rate is a component part of that. Thank you for that. This is for, you're just, you're talking about for early care and, and education providers in general or learning bridges specifically? Um, and any time there's a contract with a provider, any time not the DOE, because when it's for the DOE, the city pays for the mayor's office. The city pays for the chancellor's office. I see. The city pays for whatever muck of middle there is between the chancellor and uh, the teacher. Yes. Does not do that for our contract providers. So I'll just say, I, I hear you loud and clear. And that was a point of, of discussion with many of our early care and education providers as we're sort of launching our new, um, more integrated system. Um, so right now, so in our new contracts, um, uh, programs will be able to budget um, for their indirect costs up to 10% um, if that's required within their budget and program models or higher if it's, you know, if it can be verified. So we've provided that option to go higher, just to your point. And learning okay. bridges programs, we're trying to, we're trying to fund the expenses. Um, and so I, I think we're trying to be sensitive to your point, but the devil's in the details. And so we should talk about cases uh, perhaps Great. at another time. Yeah. Great. I'm getting texts from providers who are doing this. Shaking well, this is for head. the this is for the contracts that will be starting in July. Uh, no, so, no, I understand, yeah. and I'm about to come back to questions about those contracts in a minute. Um, of course, I want to let Deputy Commissioner Haskell finish. I also want to recognize that Councilmember Levin has joined this hearing. Please. Well, I'll ju I'll just say briefly. I wanted to build on what um, what was said about pre-K and the investments of this administration in childcare and after school in particular. For DYCD, it's been an amazing period of growth. Um, as you know, we've had, you know, essential universal after school for a middle school under this administration, um, expansion of Beacon Community Centers, expansion of Cornerstone Community Centers and NYCHA developments. Um, as a youth worker, it's been really profound to see that. And to get to your question, that infrastructure, that expansion of, of childcare is what enabled us to, um, that capacity was what enabled us to launch learning lab and learning bridges, learning lab programs this fall with the pace that we did because we had capacity. We had providers with um, programs in center-based programs across the city and we were able to build on them for the eight to three period. So um, you talked about preparing for a vision for good times. And I think when good times can create that kind of infrastructure, it's, um, you know, it allowed, it, it allowed us to pivot uh, under these extraordinary circumstances to lift up uh, learning lab programs and you know, we're grateful that investment was already there before the pandemic. I mean, I'm listening to what you're saying, but what's screaming in my head is what about after three o'clock? I mean, there's no working parent who can just come and pick up their kids at three o'clock. So, I mean, if your vision for the future involves up to three o'clock only, there's real problem there. No, absolutely. I was really referring to the expansion of after school three to six. So that it, it you know, pre-pandemic, 
the investment of this administration so that students enrolled in schools got after school services until 6 p.m. And because we had invested so much under this administration in those after school child care programs from three to six, we were able to build on that infrastructure to get to the learning lab, the earlier part. Um, so it was because we had the full day child care after school investment. I understand what okay. you're saying about providers being, I don't know, enrolled in the passport system um, so you can access them. I'm just saying that how part of your vision includes the full comprehensive need of any child giver uh, in this in the city who, you know, if they have any hope of having a job, need adequate child care, which runs till at least six o'clock at night. Um, I'm gonna move on. Uh, I'm gonna come back, but move on. I'm gonna I want to talk actually um, um, Deputy Commissioner Haskell about DYCD. It's my understanding that uh, the agency has been holding weekly calls with uh, providers and the coalition of providers. Um, I'm wondering what are the major issues that have come up on those phone calls that you've heard? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we have definitely been having weekly calls. Um, one thing, you know, shifting to remote work with it's been uh, a blessing in a way is that we can have hundreds and hundreds of people in one call, whereas, you know, previously it was, we couldn't get to our whole portfolio of programs in, in one physical meeting space. Um, but that's just part of our communication. Of course, we have regular daily emails a program manager contact. So that's just part of our, our communication. Some of the things that have been co have come up, um, there's been so many, there have been so many moving pieces since since the beginning of the pandemic that there's, you know, we've had plenty of material to discuss, including um, framing the telenurse resources that is that has um, recently become available, um, framing new Hang on, one on the telenurse. When did that become available? Um, with the launch of, uh, I, I'll have to look up the exact date, but with the launch of um, back to school, shortly after the launch of, of school in September, that resource was um, oh, okay. was made available. Got it. Sorry, keep yeah. going. No problem. We also have been helping them work through their budgets and their work scopes. I know contracts is a very important issue for you, helping to provide support on that. Um, last week, we had a um, presentation by Include NYC and one of our um, stellar providers, Morningside, to talk about um, how to support students with special needs in, in programs and share some of their best practices for the interactive dialogue with parents and, and meeting the needs of young people in the programs. Um, prior to that, we had um, a presentation I, about- yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, I get it. I'm sorry, keep going, sorry. Yeah, so, you know, there have been a lot of questions, and that's part of the reason why we're doing that weekly. In fact, I, I think a meeting just wrapped where we had a full um, a full gathering just for Q&A, uh, you know, not even a presentation, just allowing providers to come and bring their, their questions and concerns. So it really runs yes. the gamut. Yeah, I mean, I would be particularly mindful of the conversation with Include NYC and, you know, I think be important a couple of weeks from now to follow up with all the providers and ask them if that's changed who they let in and how they take care of the kids with needs. Thank you, yeah. Okay, uh, does a representative from Department of Education sit in on those calls? Uh, very often, we work um, very often either, um, we work mostly with the Office of Community Schools historically, um, Chris Caruso's team, Michelle Rosa, but more recently we've been working with the deputy chancellor's team and um, we've included them in some of those meetings as well. Do you feel, do you get any feedback about communication between providers, parents, and the agencies? You know, I, I honestly feel that our communication process has been strong. I would be very interested to hear from anyone who feels they're not getting um, adequate responses. I, I welcome, you know, our providers to reach out to me directly if they've if they've tried through their avenues and they're or they're frustrated. They need an immediate response. Many of our providers have my cell phone number, um, shaskell at dycd.nyc.gov. If anyone wants to email, I have not heard issues of communication, and I would be very interested 
to hear that feedback because um, you know, if nothing else, we can be responsive and, and we, we have been to my knowledge. So on that point, I mean, I hearken back to our hearing uh, in November and think about the parent who signed up to get a spot for her child, got a placement an hour away from her, so she couldn't take the placement. And she is now, I happen to know, uh, just gave up and so is, is sort of multitasking at home with her child home. Um, I'm wondering what kind of communication DOE does with child caregiver, you know, parents like that who um, did not take placements. Are they getting second rounds of letters telling them to come and check it out again that there might be placements closer to where they are? Um, we want to make, so I'll just say, first of all, the, the goal and then the specifics. I mean, we want to make sure that Learning Bridges is accessible to and convenient for all families. Um, so we, we heard loud and clear about that case. And if families are experiencing hardship in getting to their program, they can email us and we'll work with, you know, any family in the situation. And we added recently to our enrollment process so that they could, um, they can pick a program that is convenient for them, whether it's near where they live or where they work or where a relative uh, lives or works. Um, we are continuing to, to reach out to families um, to see if we can make an alternative placement. Um, and we will continue that outreach over the coming weeks. Uh, of course, our, our yeah, uh, so, so, and if there are specific cases that you know of, like that yeah. one where we're I mean, happy to reach out to them. Sure, I appreciate that answer, but I think that it's really actually a yes or no question. So do you have, you know, it's, it's sort of a systems question. Do you have the capacity in the system you have now to identify those people who did not take the placement they were given and has not been in touch with the DOE to send them a letter or a communication, call them to say, let's check in again and see if there's a placement that works for you. It's really just a yes or no. And I appreciate all the work you're doing, but specifically. Yeah, I'm gonna do one thing before yes or no. Our goal is to get everyone a seat first. Um, so, no so we wanna make sure that we make that offer. We have not done the outreach yet. Um, okay, um, I mean, I, I don't challenge the administration on the goal. Yeah. It, all of our goal. The question is, you know, execution and whether or not there's more you need in terms of indirect rate in order to uh, achieve the goals you want to achieve, right? No, I, 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 as I said, I think we have the resources that we need to stand up this response. We are, we reach out to families through so many channels, through the providers, through our website, through phone, et cetera. We believe that um, we, are, we are meeting this need because we're keeping up with demand. And I hope you hear, like if there's a family that's having a challenge, like the one that you mentioned, we hmm. can provide an alternative pla placement. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you can't say you're meeting up with demand if you haven't reached out to those families who turn down placements that they got in the first place during the first two months of this program. You just can't say you're meeting demand. It's not, it, you, you don't know whether or not you're meeting demand. And that's okay, it's okay, because this is like an incredibly challenging thing to take on, but I just wanna make sure we're, our language you know, I don't want to give a false impression, right? If there are parents out there right now watching this hearing, which I don't know how that would be possible, but would be sort of rolling their eyes to hear that everyone who wants something is getting something. If we don't know, you know, I, again, we're all, we all have the same goal. No, of course. And again, I think I would say, I, I hear you and, and, um, and we're always trying to do better um, and reach more families. Um, but, but if you're speaking at it from a systems perspective, 
um, we, we've stood up, you know, these 450 sites and have been able to make offers to 90% of the families on our priority list, 80% of families overall, and are on track to do all of them by the end of the year. And if there are families, please hear this. And I, I take your larger point, but really, if there are families out there listening that, right. that, that, that can't find a site nearby, we can help them find it. We've just added 4,000 additional slots since the last hearing. So there may be new ones online. Right. And I, I hear you saying we should reach out to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Saying it here, I mean, I get you. Five people are watching this hearing and 10 more are going to watch it on C SPAN. So it's, you're, this isn't, I hope this isn't part of the outreach. Um, the other thing I would recommend you do is, again, on your website, when you're saying, feel free to reach out to us, there's, there's, I don't see any, um, I'm not seeing any phone number or email address that's very clearly front and center. So people know to contact you, how to contact DOE. So I'd give that a second look as well. We absolutely mm -hmm. will, will, will take a look at that and make sure it's clear. But again, for those listening, people can call 311. Um, or learning bridges at schools.nyc.gov. Just want to make sure to put that out there. Okay. Um, so I'm really worried about um, DOE's uh, recent birth to five early head start. I think it's an RF is it an RFP uh, with funding set to begin July 1st. Um, which fundamentally for Manhattan eliminates a large number of childcare slots, especially the extended day slots. Um, I have a coalition of nine providers who shared that the process, the RFP process um, resulted in a loss of 40% of the 1,352 childcare slots that these providers service and they focus on low-income working families um, and they collectively serve all those children this year, but will lose 40% will go away for next year, given the, the new RFP. Yeah, let me clear that up because uh, uh, we're, we're so grateful that we worked very closely um, with, with the, the city council as we ran this comprehensive RFP process. Um, I'm going to back up and just say a little bit about it, not to take too much time, but I want to say over a two-year period, worked with, um, worked with the council to make sure that organizations around the city heard about this and that it included really important improvements like pay parity, like um, uh, um, making sure that there was a base payment to providers to keep them stable, et cetera. But on this specific point, we actually met with the same coalition of providers that you heard from, the Manhattan providers. And we were very careful as we designed this because our goal is to increase opportunities for, for children and families. So I wanna say we, we awarded more preschool seats in Manhattan than there, are, than there were children enrolled. Um, and so we increased uh, the opportunities to be, so that there were, there were more slots than there are children um, enrolled in those programs. Now, some of those did not go to the same program. So if you, if you pick a small group of providers, it may be that those providers didn't get awarded everything they hoped for um, and maybe saw some reductions, especially if they had fewer kids enrolled. But oh. overall, the borough of Manhattan, uh, and, 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 and by, at the zip code level, we awarded more seats than there were kids enrolled. So we saw an increase. I'll just add one more point before you respond. I think to the point about extended day and year seats, that is a place where I think, I know we share the same goals here. Those seats are funded with childcare and Head Start funds, which I won't bore all you know, our listeners with like the differences there, but to say those are, those are federal dollars and those are very scarce resources. We don't have enough funding to offer extended day and year seats everywhere in the city. We would like to be able to do that, but we just don't. We have to make choices. And that was exacerbated in this process by the fact that the city's Head Start grant uh, was reduced by $45 million. Now, 
the, the Office of Head Start awarded seats directly to community-based organizations. So there was no reduction to Head Start services in New York City. They, they kept their commitment steadfast, but we awarded fewer extended day and year seats as a result, because we just didn't have the funds. So right. if we're trying, that scarce resource we did, it was reduced and we shifted it to, to neighborhoods with the highest degree of concentrated poverty. And here's the problem mean, with that. Here's yeah. the problem. So many of those neighborhoods, the people who live in those neighborhoods but work in Manhattan, no longer have a place to bring their children because what they do is, for example, for my local provider whose program got eliminated, they have kids in there whose parents live outside of Manhattan, but they work near the childcare center. So the kids themselves are not of the zip code 10023 or 24. They have Bronx or Brooklyn or Queens or- um, Totally, uh, completely get that, which so is why that, as we I did mean, the- This is why it's but, but, but a just, problem to just not- to say, we planned, as we planned, because we heard this from providers, we didn't just look at the number of students enrolled um, where they lived, but we also looked at the demographics of the children who actually attended in the zip code. Um, so we made sure that there were opportunities, not just near where families lived, but where they work, just as you said. And again, I think, I think that I, I respect the providers and met with them myself, but, but Overall, when you look at the, the, the city, the borough, the zip code level, we have more opportunities than ever before and more than children actually enrolling. Those specific providers, again, I, I can't sort of walk through procurement results in a, in a hearing, but some of them may have lost seats. Overall, um, Manhattan did not. You know, um, I've been working on these issues for a really long time. And what I've seen uh, because of this type of thinking is that uh, the Upper West Side has become more homogenous. We've lost our low income population because there are no services around here for them. And um, basically what you're doing by having zip code be the guiding philosophy is um, segregating the city more. And I just think it is short-sighted to think that from the top down with your, I, I trust me, I, I mean, I get the numbers and I get procurement and the challenges and federal funding city funding, state funding, loss, money moving over here or there. If you would look at it from a resident's point of view, from a parent's point of view, a child caregiver's point of view, the system just isn't working. And for next year, it's gonna increase hardship for those, whatever we're talking about, 800 families. And while you may be making decisions again from the top down that seem to make sense given all the different things you're juggling, it doesn't. Neither I just I I need you to know that it doesn't. It doesn't work. Um, and there are families that are gonna have to give up their jobs because of this. There are families that um, are gonna move because of this because they know they can't get the programs they need uh, here on the West Side. Look, it's a complicated issue. I understand you have a whole city to take care of and you have a lot of low income people to take care of, but you know, we're not meeting the needs of a lot of people and we're gonna make it harder for those people next year. Don't kid yourself about that. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll respond. I mean, I. I I just want to say, I think, again, we share share the sense of urgency, share the goal, and I think ultimately want to see, you know, um, a city that's getting the support it needs to provide, you know, a, a full day coverage for every family that needs it. And we're not there yet. Um, I also would say we tried very hard 
as part of this RFP process to listen to and hear from. We had a lot of uh, providers contribute to how we structured it and so that we could avoid the mistakes of the past so that we could look at, um, at information that's specific uh, to each neighborhood so that we would make sure to account for mixed income neighborhoods where maybe the overall uh, population is fairly affluent, but there are pockets of real concentrated poverty. And I think that by and large, we, we did not take a top-down approach, but really tried to build bottom up. And we tried to create opportunities for racial and economic integration precisely by bringing these funding, the, by, by bringing these uh, funding streams and voices together. And I think that what we've done as an administration by providing pre-K for all and 3K for all in many of these districts is provided that foundation. And again, I wish we had enough funds to provide extended day and year coverage everywhere. Um, but in a world where we don't, um, we, may, we had to make the decisions. Um, and again, from a bottom up, looking at, various, at, at looking at the best information we had, moved some of those seats to areas where there were higher degrees of concentrated poverty. We had to put them where they were needed most. But even in the neighborhoods where some of those shifted, there are still pre-K for all seats and 3K for all seats in many districts. Um, and there still remain extended day and year seats in these neighborhoods, but maybe not with the same providers. And I think, I think it'd be good if, if we could sit down, you know, separately looking at this specific geography and we can sort of talk you through where the shifts were. Um, but I think we're confident that we will be able to meet the needs of working families in this area as, uh, and throughout the city because this administration has done so much to expand opportunities for early care and education all across the city. Yeah, I, I mean, let's let the, the problem goes even farther than people who've sent their kids to a certain program for the last five years now having nowhere to send their kids. The problem, in addition to the fact that they have no idea where to send their kids, is the fact that between all these providers, 125 people uh, will lose jobs. And uh, these are all primarily women, primarily women of color who will now go on unemployment. So, you know, again, I, I, don't, I don't see it. Um, and I, again, I recognize how challenging it is to figure all this stuff out. For sure. Um, no, that's why that's why we worked so closely with with your colleagues over these last two years. We wanted to do we wanted to reshape this system so that we didn't have two different systems: one that was primarily geared to income eligible and families, and the, and and another separate one for everyone else. We're able to bring these th this system together to create a unified one, where we had opportunities for racial and economic integration where we could move toward compensation equity, where we could support community-based organizations in their, you know, in giving them a base payment and fixed costs. Um, and as we get closer to July, 2021, because as you, as you know, whenever we do a big procurement like this, you're right, there are changes, there are shifts, there are difficulties, but we are committed to working hand in hand with all these organizations um, and the workers to make it work as best as, as we can. And I, I uh, the, to the extent I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't know all the details that you're discussing, but to the extent that there are talented early educators and staff in the system, um, um, we are continuing to expand, um, and and uh, we we are committed to helping them find um, good opportunities if there are changes. And there are there often are in procurements like this, though we're happy to report that in this case. 90% um, of the awards went to organizations that are currently contractors with us. So that just test that's a testament to the strength of the system. Um, but it also just shows that we, we were successful because we, we wanted to honor the work that so many good organizations have been doing. And through this procurement, we took that experience into account. Um, and so that's why, relatively speaking, um, by and large, the vast majority of awards that were given were given to, to our current contractors. So um, while we may have some shifts and changes, by and large, there's going to be stability and growth in the sector. That, that was our goal, and that's what I think we've accomplished. We're going to have to agree to disagree. Um, lastly, with regards to students with disabilities, you mentioned to Chair Traeger 
that families experiencing confusion or any issues should get in touch uh, for additional support and information. Um, can you clarify again the best way for people to get in touch? And can uh, you let me, can you confirm with me that the information is up on the website? Sure. Um, for Learning Bridges, they should, they should email learningbridges, one word, at schools.nyc.gov. And then we, we can route it to whoever, whoever needs to get it, um, or they can call uh, 311. Okay. And again, just to make it clear, there, that information is not on the website anywhere. I, I mean, on this page called Learning Bridges. Okay. Um, thank you for that. We'll, it uh, does say call 311, but um, I, I don't, I don't know what success parents get with that. I'm going to move on. Thank you so much for your time. And this morning, we spent a lot of time on this. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate Jackie Ebanks, uh, Director of the Commission on Gender Equity for her testimony and for staying here. Really appreciate DYCD and DOE and all the hard work that you all are doing. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. We have now concluded the administration's testimony and we'll turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Lisa Caswell, Daycare Council of New York, Randy Levine, Advocates for Children of New York, Tammy Miller, United Federation of Teachers, and Amanda Kogut Rosenau. I will now call on Lisa Caswell. Hang on one second, if I can just jump in. I can see that the deputy chancellor is still on the Zoom. I wanna let him know how much I appreciate that. And I hope you'll stay at least for the first panel because we're gonna hear some actual stories, real detailed information. I appreciate your staying on to hear that. Thank you. I'll go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Chair oh, Rosenthal oh. and Chair Traeger. My name is Lisa Caswell, and I am the Daycare Council of New York Senior Policy Analyst. In June of this year, we conducted a research project with 13 emergency child care programs to see how they were operating during the pandemic. We met with nine of our member centers and four family daycare programs. Our key findings led to eight recommendations, all of which are included in our full testimony. Two of these recommendations are reflected in the DECE's core COVID-19 response, which has led to significant stability at a critical time. First, they made sure that centers had no more than one cohort of children on site each day to minimize the risk of exposure. Second, they made the commitment to fully fund programs at their contracted capacity with the support of the state. The impact of these two decisions cannot be overstated. At this time, we are working with the DECE to increase nursing supports. We also hope to work on scheduling more visits with mental health providers and training new staff in the trauma support model. We have three areas of concern that go beyond the parameters of our study. One, providers continue to face three to four month delays in the DECE's processing of applications. If an exception to the city's current hiring freeze could be made, it would help families who may be overwhelmed or are trying to return to work. Second, providers still face extended delays in DOHMH's processing of staff background clearances. While new hires can start work under the supervision of another qualified staff member, this backlog is an ongoing source of stress to the entire system. Three, we would like to restate the significance of the recent loss in full day, full year capacity within the current DOE birth to five RFP awards, particularly for two year olds. While we know shifting demographics are a determining factor, we absolutely must have more federal funding. 
so that we can regain these lost seats and then add more. If we're going to build back better, New York City must be able to offer real opportunities to all low-income working families. To do this, we must maintain our full-day, full-year childcare infrastructure, particularly for those living in subsidized housing. Finally, with any relief funding, the city must allocate hazard-enhanced pay for all family childcare programs that are serving income-eligible families and remained open at the onset of the pandemic, regardless of whether they had to temporarily or intermittently close due to COVID during the pandemic. This is in addition to their current pay. These providers opened their homes to our children when we were all at our most vulnerable and they deserve our support. Thank you for your service to this great city and for the opportunity to testify before you. We really appreciate the support of both public and private sector. This has been um, a difficult time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Randy Levine, you may begin when the Sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the impact of COVID-19 on childcare. My name is Randy Levine and I'm the Policy Director of Advocates for Children of New York. First, I wanna say how much I appreciate the focus on early childhood education from this administration, as well as the city's very hard work to get learning bridges up and running. We join with our colleagues today in expressing concern about the impact of the pandemic on the city's childcare programs with added expenses and reduced enrollment. Many programs are struggling to continue operating and need assistance. We wanna use our limited time today to talk about two issues based on what we're hearing on the ground from families. First, we're hearing from families whose preschoolers with disabilities do not have the preschool special education programs they need and have a legal right to receive. While many young children with disabilities participate in childcare programs, others require preschool special education classes with smaller child to teacher ratios and specialized support. By early March, 2020, hundreds of young children were already sitting at home, not because of the pandemic, but because the DOE did not have enough seats in preschool special education classes. The DOE's own projections showed a shortfall of more than 1,000 preschool special education class seats for the spring of 2020, despite the city's efforts to open more classes over the past two years. Contributing to this shortage is the fact that a number of CBOs, which run the majority of these classes, have closed their preschool special education programs due to insufficient funding. The pandemic has exacerbated these financial challenges leaving programs with increased costs that make it even harder to continue operating. And although there has been a decrease in special education referrals during the pandemic, we have already heard from families this year whose children do not have seats in the preschool special education classes required by their IEPs. And we worry that this problem will grow in the spring. The city must meet its legal obligation to provide a preschool special education class seat to every child whose IEP requires one either by opening more DOE run classes or by ensuring CBOs do so. I also wanna note that part of the challenge is that the teachers in preschool special education programs at CBOs were left out of the early childhood salary parity agreement described earlier, and that needs to be corrected going forward. Second, we're hearing from families whose children have been turned away illegally from learning bridges programs due to their disabilities. Although the city is giving priority status to students with disabilities in selecting students for the program, the program has no resources or process for providing accommodations and supports to students who need more support than the staffing ratio currently funded by the city. I wanna thank the council for the attention they've given to this issue today. Unfortunately, we still have unresolved cases of children who have been turned away because of their disabilities who do not have five day a week in-person instruction I'm families are struggling to get by at this point and need more support. Remote learning has been extremely challenging for students with significant disabilities and their families. The mayor promoted learning bridges as a way to help students and families when students cannot be in school and to live up to its promise and to comply with the law. The city must provide the support needed to include students with disabilities in the learning bridge program. We're really grateful for the attention you brought to these issues today and look forward to working with you. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Before we go on to the next panelist, real quick, um, Ms. Levine, can I ask you, 
have those parents tried 311 or emailed the Learning Bridges program? We have unresolved cases where Advocates for Children, special education attorneys at Advocates for Children have reached out to Central Department of Education staff, Central DYCD staff, um, and we do not have answers to those cases. So you can only imagine how hard it must be for parents who have not found their way to Advocates for Children to get assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will have Tammy Miller. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Miller, and I serve as the chair of the United Federation of Teachers Family Child Care Providers Chapter. On behalf of the more than 10,000 U of T family child care providers, I would like to thank chairpersons Helen Rosenthal and Mark Traeger. The U of T this year created a new provider network contracted with the DOE to support child care providers. We are asking the city council to help cut through the red tape and bureaucratic inefficiencies we have encountered that have resulted in fewer families receiving the child care they need. The challenges have been steep. The current regulations are forcing highly trained providers out of this work and thwarting networks abilities to support individual providers who in turn provide childcare services to families in desperate need. First, Despite the DOE contract for the network providers starting on July 1, 2020, access to the web enrollment system was not granted until late November, 2020, nearly five months after the start of the program. As a result of this delay, children who were preliminarily enrolled were not able to complete their enrollment and were lost to other programs or their families simply gave up entirely on the system out of frustration. We recommend that the DOE immediately resolve all technical issues and prioritize family outreach and enrollment. And now full turnover of provider and family information in the system continues to slow the enrollment process, as well as the process to notify families about upcoming recertification, which is again causing families to give up. We recommend the DOE work on ensuring that systems not notifications are both accurate and timely. And lastly, I'd like to touch on how the DOE's funding and reimbursement model hamstrings networks and hurts the ability to provide childcare options to providers and parents. The DOE only re reimburses for actual expenses and at a percentage of the complete child enrollment each network has in any given month. For example, if in December, a network shows it is at 72% child enrollment, but in January, due to, for an example, a major COVID-19 outbreak, your enrollment drops to 63%, then the network can only submit for actual expense reimbursements up to 72% for December and 63% for January. Clearly that model is flawed. If a network is required to implore four educational specialists to attend to 60 providers to meet the mandated provider po um, position to provider ratio, the network must still pay those individuals at 100% of their salaries, regardless of the fluctuations in enrollment. We recommend that networks hiring budgets be fully funded to ensure continuity of employment, salary stability, and an avoidance of compromising quality for quantity. Finally, we have shared our concerns and our recommendations with the Department of Education, yet they have failed to modify their operations to account for these unprecedented times. We truly hope that City Council can assist us in advocating for the DOE to help us so we can better help the families and children in need. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you and for this hearing. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Amanda Kogut Rosenau. I start now. Oh. 
Oh, sorry. Good morning. Um, my name is Amanda Kogut Rosena. I'm the Vice President of Programs at Nontraditional Employment for Women, or NEW. Um, we're a 42 year old nonprofit with a record of transforming economic prospects for women through jobs in the skilled trades and careers. Um, I'd like to thank the City Council and the Women's Committee for the opportunity to speak on behalf of, our tr of the tradeswomen who are so integral in building the future of New York and the impact that the pandemic and childcare crisis is having on women's participation in the workforce. Childcare has been and continues to be a primary challenge for women entering the workforce and advancing in their careers, and new graduates are no exception. Despite the high wages a trades career can offer, cost and access to childcare continues to pose a challenge. New social services incorporates planning for current and future childcare throughout our programming. Um, in, in 2019, the Comptroller released a report showing that combined, New York City's center-based and home-based providers had the capacity to provide care for just 22% of all the children born in the city between the ages of zero and two. The same report cites the federal government recommends costs for childcare not exceed 8% of an individual's income, and yet, New York City minimum wage workers can spend almost 68% of their income on childcare. And our city's education system has thus become the de facto means of affordable care for school aged education and children. COVID-19 and the related shutdowns have transformed this existing challenge into a crippling barrier and demonstrated our inability to provide the basic services needed for children and families to thrive. Approximately 32% of new students are single parents with nowhere to turn for children for, for childcare support as center-based capacity has plummeted and schools vacillate unpredictably between in-person and remote learning. Even those with a partner or parent at home often are unable to pursue full-time work as they manage remote schooling and other household affairs. In the case that childcare is affordable and accessible, many new graduates are concerned that using a childcare service will expose their child themselves or their families to member, and members to COVID-19. According to the Center for American Progress, in September alone, four times as many women exited the workforce compared to men, with women of color at most, at most risk for economic instability. New estimates that at least 35% of our graduates have been unable to pursue a career launching employment opportunity because they've been, they've been unable to find or afford childcare for their children. This is not unique to the new community. It's a systemic barrier and most evident in under-resourced communities and has the potential to undo the hard, work, the hard won progress towards gender equity in the workforce and US economy. To create an equitable, equitable recovery, the city must take bold and permanent steps and offer reasonably priced safe childcare to, in vacant spaces around the city and thereby address this dual barrier to New Yorkers seeking to earn a living and providing the next generation of New Yorkers with the academic and socio-emotional supports needed to grow and thrive. Thank you for your time and attention to this issue that is harming both parents and children, particularly New York's most vulnerable. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn back to the chairs for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Um, Actually, for some specific panelists first, Ms. Miller, can you repeat again what you said about the actual reimbursement rates compared to 100% of costs? Um, you said something about 63 and 78. I couldn't quite follow what you were saying. Can you reread that part of your testimony? Yes, thank you. I'll be happy to reread that. So, um, where is it? So the way the system is, the DOE only reimburses for actual expenses and at the percentage of complete child enrollment each network has in any given month. For example, if in, net, if in December, a network shows that it has 72% of child enrollment, but in January, due to any unforeseen circumstance, that enrollment drops to 63%, then the network can only submit for actual expense reimbursement, up to, which in this example, which would be up to 70% for this, 72% for December and 63% for January. And so I don't know if you want me to expound a little bit more on that, but certainly as you can imagine, it forces the network to make harsh decisions in terms of the staffing that they are employing simply because they're only being reimbursed at those specific levels that apply specifically to child enrollment. 
Um, and I just want to confirm, uh, I have somebody at my door at the office, so I have to jump for a second, but I want to confirm that you've submitted your testimony. Yes, we've submitted our full testimony and I will make sure if we have it, but I'm pretty certain we have. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you for putting these things on the record. Chair Traeger, may I ask, are you available? Are you ready to ask a few questions of this panel? Or sure, I, I, I've been thank just, you. yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I just, uh, I think folks, first of all, I wanna thank everyone for uh, their, their work and their testimony and their time here today. Um, I just wanted just to kind of harken back to uh, if folks follow the exchange that we had with the administration earlier um, about clearly not meeting the need. And we've heard a number of stories, you know, obviously about children with special needs being turned away. Um, number of stories that were just inadequate amount of services for um, children in, in high need communities. Um, one quick question, just trying to figure out if you're hearing it from your end of, your end of the spectrum as well, as far as hot meals and food um, at, uh, at these locations and settings. Has that something come up to your, to your knowledge? Can you share any information about that? I, I'd appreciate it. You're asking us, the daycare council has not heard of that issue. Um, we did work with our members early on to try to activate the kitchens in the daycare programs to serve local local uh, residents, uh, but we haven't heard about the hot meal issue recently. Yeah, and also I am very mindful that a number of our sites are not really suited to prepare hot meals. The issue is, is that we find a way to make it work for other uh, populations in New York City. And there seems to be no will or, bill or interest in making it work for children. Um, and also, I am pretty sure that there are many food vendors across the city of New York that would love the ability to work with New York uh, to prepare hot meals and we can work to, to distribute it in, in the 21st century, I think we can get that done. That is not impossible. Many restaurants are hurting, many uh, small businesses are hurting, food vendors are hurting. Um, and also to point out, we did a little quick research, other school districts in other, other parts of the country, uh, which always look to New York to be the model, they're providing hot meals to their, kid, to their kids. And yeah, they face greater challenges than we do, but they're finding a way to make it work. And this is one, you know, I know that this might be like a small example in a big hearing like this, but it does make a difference because it is coming up. And, and then I've heard from providers directly um, where sometimes there's, they rely on the DOE to, uh, to deliver whatever grab and go meals and sites and this, and sometimes there are delivery issues. So I just wanted just to put that on folks' radar and I thank you for, 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 uh, for your testimony. And Chair Rosenthal, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much on following up on the hot meals. Uh, Chair Traeger, really appreciate that. Um, you know, and I hope the DOE and DYCD heard that question loud and clear because if families, you know, when, families, obviously, no one can learn if they're not eating. Uh, so really appreciate you. Um, Ms. Miller, I'm sorry I got interrupted. I'm technology issues. I'm holding down the port at my office and occasionally constituents need services. Um, so I, I apologize for stepping away for a moment. Um, Ms. Miller, you talked about lack of support for providers. Can you give some maybe specific examples of what providers face? Like what exact supports could DOE or DYCD be providing that would be helpful? Sure, um, first and foremost, I wanna say again, thank you for even this question. Um, many of the supports that providers are facing have to do with expenses that they have to incur um, specifically given the very low rates they are paid per child, it creates an inability for them to sustain the business 
to pay their staff, to pay things such as workers' comp, liability insurance. Um, also, um, since I, I know Chair Traeger was just talking about food, there's a huge food insecurity for the children that attend daycare. And many of the providers are finding that they have to struggle just to send food home for these families that are struggling. Um, if you factor that in and then you factor the additional cost of PPE supplies and all the materials they need to maintain business, they're finding that they are having fewer children show up because of the, the family's preference for a blended learning model, remote learning even, then they're dealing with the fact that because these are younger children, they don't always have the technical supports home that the older children would have. So we're dealing with a, a really a deluge of, of, of issues that providers face all around funding there. Many of them have closed their doors um, because they feel as though there's no financial support. Many have applied for the CARES Act and they haven't been funded. They haven't received that money. So they're forced to make really hard decisions, laying off staff. Um, they can't employ their, keep their employers employed. And that's just to name a few. I don't wanna belabor your time, but there are so many issues that they are facing with finances being the most critical thing, um, not having that money coming in to support them to maintain and stay in business and keep their staff employed. Um, thank you so much for sharing this information with the public, with us, and, and hopefully the administration is listening and will make changes. Really, really appreciate that. Ms. Levine, um, could you talk a little bit more, and boy, you're, you obviously are, Include NYC is obviously working closely with families in need. You're, uh, you're giving legal support to families that um, are trying to get the Department of Education to pay attention to their child and to meet the needs of their child. Uh, Tell, do, do you have a story or two you want to tell about how they are excluded from the programs? Sure. I think we're seeing several different ways in which they're excluded. Um, and, you know, Advocates for Children is, is hearing this from a number of families. And to answer your earlier question, some of them first tried contacting those general inboxes. Um, and then contacted Advocates for Children when they didn't get responses. But to give one example, I'm going to start with a, an example that I think is now a success story to also give the city credit where due. Um, there was an example of a case that I actually raised briefly at the council's hearing on the impact of COVID-19 on students with disabilities, which I believe happened in mid to late October. Um, and that was an example of a kindergarten student with autism. Um, and his parent was very happy that he was matched with a program because his school was only giving him one day a week of in-person learning. And it was a real struggle both for the parent as far as her job and as far as this student who also has siblings on the other days of the week. And so the parent was very excited when she got an offer for a learning lab program. But when she contacted the program and described her child's needs, they said, your child can't attend. They gave several reasons, um, including the fact that he has autism and the program is not equipped to serve a student with autism. And the fact that he, um, he needs help to use the toilet. Um, and so they said, you can only come if you have a one-to-one -one paraprofessional who can help with your toileting needs, as well as training for the staff on how to work with a student with autism. And so we raised that. I actually thought that this one might be easy to resolve because the student has a one-to-one -one paraprofessional on his IEP. So he gets this service at school as well and has a right to this service. And so if the DOE's and the city solution to, you know, not giving a student full-time in-person instruction was to give learning bridges, I thought surely they would just send that support who's with him during the day in school to the learning bridge program. 
but we quickly discovered that due to union issues, the city said that they were not able to send his one-to-one -one mandated paraprofessional to the learning lab program. Um, and unfortunately, it took about a month um, for the city to say that they had worked it out with the school to provide him with five day a week in-person instruction, which was definitely the parent's preference. His first day was supposed to be November 30th. Mm. November 30th, all school system wide were shut down. Um, and so his first day in person full time was last week and he had a very good first week and his parent is very pleased that he's able to be in school full time oh. in person, but also concerned because what if school shut down again, either system wide or what if his school shuts down again. So that's a success story. I'll be briefer just to tell you a couple of other things that we're hearing. Well, and the success story is very illustrative of how challenging a success story is. And the fact that we're, for that one success story, there are, I'm sure, dozens of families, hundreds of families that aren't lucky enough to have that success. And I can't tell you how much back and forth it took and how many people were involved. And again, we appreciate that the DOE was able to get him the student in person full time instruction, but it took a lot of effort. Um, there are other students we're hearing from where they're in a District 75 program usually. So that's what's on their IEP. And so they're normally in a class of for some of them six students for some of them eight students. Their District 75 school currently is not offering full day, five day a week in person learning. And so their parent applied to Learning Bridge only to be told that the program can't meet the needs of a student who needs that level of support. There are programs that have said, you know, what we're funded to do is to help the student get from their iPad to their remote learning. Um, and if a student needs more support than that, you know, we don't have a way of doing that. And we know programs have also been asking the city for this help and have not been able to get it. Um, we also heard from more than one student who enrolled in the program, spent a day or two there, and then were told, I'm sorry, we can't meet your needs because in order to serve you, we need additional staff, we, or we need some type of support um, with our current funding and our current contract we're not able to meet the needs of a student who uh, has this need first for additional support. Thank you, very illustrative. I also wanna recognize we've been joined by council member Barron uh, in case she was not recognized previously. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone on this panel for the work that you're doing day in day out fighting for our children. I'm, I'm blown away by, um, I'm so glad you exist. You know, our children are really lucky um, that you're out there fighting for them. Thank you. That concludes the first panel of public testimony. Next. We will hear from Gregory ben Brender of United Neighborhood Houses, Mary Chang from Chinese American Planning Council, Deborah Sue Lorenzen from St. Nixon Alliance, Leanne Scaduto from Hudson Guild, and Karen Berry from Hamilton Madison House. I will now call on Gregory Brender. You may begin when the Sergeant at Arms gives you the cue. Time starts now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Chager, Chair Rosenthal, the members of the council for the opportunity to testify. My name is Gregory Brender and I'm here on behalf of United Neighborhood Houses and joined on this panel by, uh, by several of our members. Um, I think everyone on this Zoom from providers to council members to folks in government to advocates has been talking about how childcare is important for a long time, but the pandemic has really I think lay that bear for so many more people. And one of the things we've really seen during this pandemic is the increased dependence on community-based organizations through um, a rapid transition to remote programming through the uh, launch of regional Richmond centers and learning bridges. And so we've put together in our testimony, which you have uh, a full written testimony with all of the stuff in detail, uh, several key recommendations uh, to, sure, to ensure that the city supports CBOs in this. 
Uh, first, we want to urge the city to um, maintain funding regardless of enrollment. We do believe that enrollment is now artificially low, both in early childhood programs and in school age programs due to issues like obviously biggest being decreased participation due to COVID, but also um, issues around the enrollment procedures for child care subsidies and the transition of family child care contracts. Um, we also urge the city to offer incentive pay to CBO providers, um, including family child care homes who were open during uh, the height of the pandemic. Um, we also want to talk about the need to restore funding to, for indirect rates. This is something we were glad to hear the council bring up, something that um, really supports CBOs, particularly in a situation like now where there's such need for rapid transition, rapid reprogramming. Um, and finally, and what you'll hear from, from all of our colleagues, and this is an issue, and I want to thank uh, both Council Member Traeger and Council Member Rosenthal uh, for bringing this up, is to talk about the uh, loss of slots in um, particularly the income, gen um, income stratified neighborhoods. Um, and you're going to hear from our members. Um, I know we heard that 91% of, uh, of contracts went to existing providers, but most of those contracts were, as you'll hear, um, actually a lot smaller and in some cases unsustainable. Um, so I think I'd like to uh, have you hear from all the providers on their individual um, uh, issues with this, um, but we have our uh, full testimony that goes into some of the ways to address um, really the issues uh, threatening the sustainability of the childcare programs that I think the city now recognizes are so important to uh, reopening and recovery. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, you'll hear from Mary Cheng. Time starts now. Hi, thank you, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Traeger, the Committee of Gender Equity and Committee on Education, and the members of City Council for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mary Cheng. I'm the Director of CBC Childhood Development Services, overseeing 12 early childhood and school age programs. And I was a former CPC student now, um, and now staff. So I really can say that CPC tries to empower our constituents as agents of social change. To that end, we are grateful to testify about the issues and impacts on, and to the individuals and families we serve. And we are grateful to the council for their leadership on these issues. Our written testimony will address the following concerns on the danger of center closures and loss of slots for low income and working families across New York City and family child care a providers hard hit by the pandemic and need our support. CPC's early childhood programs are truly critical safety nets for thousands of working class AAPI and immigrant families. Under COVID-19, child care programs have been extremely stressed and under pressure. As a coalition, we found that the recent RFP, uh, Birth to Five RFP, awards through DOE resulted in our coalition of nine settlement houses losing 39% of all slots and 72% of all extended day slots. We also lost a lot of toddler and 3K slots. We seek restoration of at least 17 million to the coalition to help ensure low-income immigrant and working families continue to have the care they need for their younger children. DOE used the code median to determine where the slots were awarded, but these neighborhoods still have major facilities, pockets of poverty, and immigrant hubs quality programs. These sites deserve awards due to their long track of quality serving generations of families and they should not be cut arbitrarily due to the code data points. These are real families, not statistics. We have lost 72% of extended day slots across extended day seats across the coalition, um, which will lead to families not being able to work and women not having having to leave the workforce. DOE birth to five partial awards, um, which were awarded like funding one classroom out of four classrooms that we service. Due to this, many of more than 40% of the survey settlements early childhood centers will be forced to shut down entirely. As CPC, we know that we will be forced to shut down two of our centers at the heart of Chinatown because of this very reason. And it will create new childcare deserts in replacement of that. As CPC, families come to us throughout the five boroughs because they trust us, because we offer culturally and linguistically sensitive programs, 
with wraparound supports to help families achieve better quality of life. And we hope that the council will help us advocate for restoration in the upcoming year. Our slides and the testimony will be submitted to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Deborah Sue Lorenzen. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Sue Lorenzen, and I'm the Director of Youth and Education at St. Nick's Alliance in North Brooklyn. On behalf of the children and families of Small World Early Childhood Center, St. Nick's Alliance is deeply committed to sustaining the generations long impact of this center on our community's youngest citizens. It is our great honor to help them develop the critical school readiness skills needed to thrive in kindergarten and beyond. I'm testifying today to alert city council that the elimination or redirection of two-year-old slots, extended day services and year-round services from the birth to five award undermine the cultural and economic diversity of students we serve and the financial viability of small world and other settlement house child operated child care centers. For more than 45 years, St. Nick's has helped transform the lives of low and moderate income families. We are known for our innovative programming with an emphasis on socio-emotional academic, academic supports intended to help low-income children succeed in school. St. Nick serves early childhood, community school, after-school services for 6,000 children. And we're critical to our community. At St. Nick's Small World Daycare Center is the earliest gateway into these services for low-income families with children as young as two who benefit from the publicly funded full day and full year services long established at this center. St. Nick's typically provides free or low cost services to 108 two to four year olds through a two year old classroom, three year old classrooms and UPK classrooms. 72 two and three year olds receive subsidized extended day and extended year services and 36 children are funded through UPK. We are very grateful that our Birds of Five Award adds another three-year-old classroom, but the new Birth to Five Award will eliminate every two-year-old slot and every extended day, extended year slot for threes and fours that we requested. The elimination of these slots will eradicate Small World's ability to provide low-income families with the same full-day, full-year services as wealthier families in our mixed-income community. SNA commissioned a 2018 community assessment data survey, which identified a high number of children by income and poverty status who are eligible for early childhood services and a corresponding significant shortage of quality seats to meet the need. More than 56% of residents are non-white, 42% live in poverty, and families in 11211 receive public assistance at a much higher rate than families living in other parts of our city. Yet the data also demonstrate that the need for quality childcare is especially prominent among the very young children living in public housing, children with disabilities, children with and children in foster care. We desperately need for these seats to be preserved and we thank the city council for their attention today in this matter and for your pursuit of ensuring they're restored. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Leanne Scadito. Good Sorry about that. Good afternoon. Hudson Gill thanks the Committee on Education and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for this opportunity to speak about the future of early childhood education in New York City, which is both an anchor for the start of a child's academic life and a lifeline to employment for thousands of women raising children and working in human services. My name is Leanne Scaduto, and in my role as Deputy Executive Director at Hudson Guild, I have the privilege of overseeing programming for nearly 300 two, three, and four-year-old children who begin their learning process in our centers in Chelsea and alongside the west and along the west side of Manhattan. The children in our program are part of families living at the lowest household incomes in the city, and their caregivers, prominently women, require access to quality, free, or low-cost early education that will ensure a strong start for their child and provide safe and productive care while parents work, go to school, or look for work. As we have seen during COVID, access to childcare is essential to both educational growth 
and economic viability. That has always been true for the families who are part of Hudson Guild's programs. For that reason, we are very concerned about the potential impact on children and families in our community that will result from the provisional awards announced in the New York City Department of Education's birth to five procurement slated to take effect in July. Specifically, we are concerned about the unintended impacts on children from low income households in gentrified neighborhoods. Over 90% of children in Hudson Gill's programs are NYCHA residents who have no access to the market rate amenities that exist in our community. For most of our families, loss of services means loss of early childhood education. Further, many of the kids in our program have other critical connections to the Guild, whether it be parents in mental health, a grandmother coming to us for meals, or an older sibling in our after school program. At the Guild, early childhood is part of a network of programming serving the whole family. Head Start is an important part of our network of services. It is not, however, an equal substitute for DOE's birth to five programs. They serve different children from different families. The awards proposed by the DOE will eliminate options for families who are poor, but just above the poverty level. It is one of the most vulnerable populations that needs subsidized childcare. This group of low income families will have nowhere to obtain quality education in the community they know which supports them. For low income working families who currently offer full day and full year early childhood education for children who are two, three and four years old, it is essential programming that allows families to make progress on their goals. That will be entirely eliminated in our community under the provisional awards. Not only will we no longer be able to serve two and three year olds and lose continuity of care, but our families are also losing hours of care and education. We currently provide 2,620 hours of education to every child on a yearly basis. Under the pro proposed awards, our families would only get 1,116 hours. Each child and family is losing 57% of their early childhood education. They're only getting 43% of the services they need and would have to pay for the remaining 57% of these services. Our families cannot afford this and therefore will not be able to work. It is our hope that the city council will work with its partners in government to ensure that $17 million is restored for the slots at our nine settlement houses, a holistic, sufficient early childhood education network, which serves the needs of all children in the city must be funded and implemented. That will require an adequate number of funded seats, regardless of zip code, providing quality, comprehensive, full day, full year education for children ages two, three, and four. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. We are happy to answer any questions and provide any additional information the committee may want. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Karen Berry. Time starts now. Yes. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member Traeger and members of the committee. Um, I'm Karen Berry, the Assistant Executive Director for Early Childhood at Hamilton Madison House a community service organization that's been operating on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and Chinatown for more than a century. For decades, we have operated a very sizable early childhood education program designed to help young children from low-income families develop socially and emotionally while preparing for formal education, also extending a broad range of support to parents. We are gratified that many thousands of uh, parents have expressed appreciations for, for these programs that we provide and our performance has constantly been highly rated by New York City government. As a result of the recent RFP process conducted by the New York City Department of Education, the center-based early childhood education program currently operated by us um, to more than 200 families will be dr dramatically reduced as of July uh, 2021. I join with my colleagues on the panel today in facing similar circumstances and expressing alarm about the situation, declaring that it's very unfair for uh, low-income families to lose services because higher income people reside in the neighborhoods and DOE has decided to redirect resources to homogeneously low-income neighborhoods. Although we certainly support adding programs in those neighborhoods. Um, we are calling for restoration of funds in the amount of $17 million to maintain services in the neighborhoods represented by our coalition. It's also very important that I must add, it's not only uh, the programs funded by New York City DOE that will be lost if this, er if this error is not rectified. Uh, Hamilton Madison is 
um, in the midst of adding criti a critical layer to the early childhood education programs in the form of a two generation initiative. Through this undertaking, which is part of a national movement, we go through lengths to engage parents in the education of their children to support their own education and professional development, which will put them on a um, path out of generational poverty. The rationale behind the effort is that better outcomes when children and parents are involved simultaneously and and um, in efforts to design to advance the goals of our family members. There's a lot of research to support this, this evidence. Our 2G offerings and planned efforts uh, include, but not limit to English as a second language instruction to support and support graduate graduate from high school, access to college, complete college, gain better access to health care and mental health services, improve family finances. Already dozens of families have benefited from this initiative. I thank the committee for the opportunity to testify about this critical matter. And I join my colleagues in expressing uh, readiness to partner with the city council over the next few months to restore the $17 million to our community to ensure that community children and families are not denied the services they sorely need and certainly deserve. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn back to the chairs for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. And thank you to this panel for um, sharing the actual impact that uh, articulating what's actually happening on the ground. So we really appreciate that. I mean, it's hard to believe the Department of Education when they say that uh, they can eliminate $17 million from the system and more kids will be uh, given slots. It's, that's a hard, hard pill to swallow. Um, I have some specific questions um, for Mary Chang from uh, the Chinese Planning Commission. The DOE claims there will be, and this is my question, that there will be more slots in total. And I'm wondering for your families in particular, how does that square? for them, um, for the programs that had were funded for four classrooms who are now gonna be funded for one, what's happening to the kids in the other three classrooms? What's the rationale for only funding one? Um, and what does do we say when you are trying to explain this to them? You know, um, Deputy Chancellor Wallach said that he did meet with coalition members, I'm assuming you're one of them, CPC is one of them. What's the rationale, what's, what's the thought, do you have any sense of what the thought process is and what your families are going to do? Um, so for us, I mean, I think when he mentioned that the slots and how he displayed it to us and described it to us was that it was, there was no loss in slots overall across the city. But what he did do was that it ended up being where people are getting pockets of slots. And you're not funding us by program, you're funding us for a certain number of slots. And that's where the issue lies. Because our program doesn't run on just 18 slots that you're going to give me. It runs on the total amount to cover all the costs that's involved. So if you're giving me only 18 slots, I really can't survive on that, right? So what's happening now is that now we have to figure out, and we haven't shared with our families yet. We have been really understanding we're in the middle of a pandemic. How are we supposed to share that? Come July, what services you have now, you're not going to receive next year. So we have two-year-olds, we have three-year-olds, and we don't know where they're going to go next year. But right? hypothetically, and, he said there were more slots overall in Manhattan, he said. So are they helping you find where those slots are so you can connect your kids to those programs? They haven't provided us any list. They said everything's in negotiation, so we're not privy to the information at this time. So it's we've been trying to request data from them um, and we haven't received anything. And 
and it's unacceptable because we're looking at six months time and you know how are we going to be transparent with our family in this matter and in raising this issue and it's not fair i know we're living where we're coming day in and day out we're already on that hot seat where we're reacting to everything that's coming along but this is something that is planned and i feel like Releasing it now in September when we were going through reopening, when we were dealing with all of that, and then to drop this bomb on us. And we're balancing both sides, and everybody's working almost 24 7 trying to figure out both sides of this issue. And if, at the end of the day, what we're hurting is our family. We, we, we need to know where are they going to get the support? Which they turn to? Right? Okay. So and we don't have answers. Yeah, thank you. I mean, so the Department of Education is confident in saying there are more Manhattan slots than there are currently, but they can't tell you where to send your the kids who currently come to your centers. And when they have a contract with you, they're contracting for one room instead of four rooms. And so when you say to the DOE, look, we're just not going to accept that contract because we can't do one room if we have four classrooms full of kids, what do they say? They haven't said anything because we haven't been in negotiations with them. We don't even know when that's gonna happen at this time. So we're on this, we didn't wanna play this leading game with them. That's yeah. why we formed as a coalition to try and get information from our partners and see where we're at in this because we're not the only one in this boat. And this is where we're, we're coming to everybody is like, we need to really plan this out. This isn't like something we can just say like, oh, come July, we're, this is what's gonna happen. It, there has to be a process for us and it's not fair at the end of the day to the families and the community that we're serving. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, to Leanne Scuduto, could, could you answer the same question? Um, sure, I, I think, um, we don't know where our families will go. Uh, we've been trying to figure out our on our own. Um, I think uh, part of the issue for us is that we do serve the whole family. So um, families come to us for all these different services, and now their early childhood is going to be potentially pulled out if there is if there is a slot somewhere else. Um, then they might come back to us for after school, right? You, the one of the main aspects of um, the DOE's RFP was continuity of care. And they even encouraged us to apply for this equal number of classrooms for two, three, and four-year-olds in the RFP. Um, uh, we were only awarded four-year-olds. So um, there's, a, there's a huge loss of continuity of care there, families having to switch locations and centers. Um, and then when you add on it, the reduced number of hours that most of us were provided um, and how parents are going to pay for that difference, I, I, it, it might not be financially viable for people, uh, for our families to be able to work and they'll have to make decisions about, um, you know, what, what they're going to do. I, I, I do not understand how this is going to work and we have not been given a lot of information from the Department of Education on, um, as Mary said, on the timelines, on negotiations, on what we do with centers that are half or a quarter funded, um, there are a lot of issues and concerns um, that we still have. And this is going to deeply, deeply negatively impact um, our families, not to mention I, I, a lot of these children are not gonna be able to go to early childhood programs and they're not gonna be kindergarten ready. And it's going to impact the DOE. In, in, in having to figure out what to do when children come to them in kindergarten and don't have um, the educational um, background and content that they need. So I, I unfortunately just see a lot, of, um, a lot of negative impact here and we're hoping that we can do something now at this point to start to correct some of that. So in other words, and, and I tried to make this point with the deputy chancellor, this is the difference of looking at something from the top down versus from the, the caregiver's point of view up. So for a, a, a parent, a caregiver, they're gonna have to drop their two-year-old off at one site, their four-year-old off at another site, 
and maybe pick up their two-year-old to get the after school or after time after three o'clock care back to the site where the four-year-old is. It, it's nonsensical. Um, and then uh, for Gregory Bender um, from UNH, if I could just ask you to speak to what you meant by your statement that enrollment is artificially low right now because the deputy chancellor did seem to say that was the reason why they could take uh, slots away from current providers. Yeah, so there's, a, there's actually a lot of reasons that um, enrollment is low and, and it's a problem that we sort of base the future numbers based on current enrollment because of it. Um, so the first is just um, that there are um, some families now who are probably going to transition from being work from home to uh, working in person as more and more businesses open up potentially in the future. Um, so they may not they may not be enrolled for um, the remote programming, but they're still enrolled uh, for um, uh, they would still need childcare and enroll once they return to in person work. Um, but then in the childcare system, and particularly in the early learn extended day extended year programs, there are significant problems with the enrollment procedures, where providers are reporting wait lists of families who have applied. So a lot of centers actually have, um, and centers and family childcare homes actually have parents who have applied who are waiting for determination. Um, and we know that that system is currently backed up, that there are a number of reasons for it, including um, the furlough of many DOE staff and the um, many DOE staff working at home and new systems being replaced. But to us, it's evidence that the current enrollment numbers, both at a macro level citywide, but also at individual levels of centers and family child care homes are not accurate. Um, and then finally, the Family Child Care Network um, uh, contracts went into place this July with new networks starting in September. So during the heat of the pandemic, um, and, but also um, there's just been um, issues with particularly some of the new networks uh, transitioning providers from networks that may have changed their um, catchment areas or just um, not gotten contracts in the last RFP to the new networks. So therefore the enrollment in family child care really reflects what's essentially an administrative issue and one that we believe that and hope that will be fixed and therefore shouldn't be used the current enrollment numbers as a reflection of need. Yeah, that's very instructive. I appreciate you. Thank you to all our panelists for the hard work you're doing. Thank you. I'm turning it back to the moderator. Um, Chair Traeger, did you want to ask questions of this panel? Um, I, I, I thought you really hit on very many critical points, Chair. Um, I, I will just also note, and I think we've heard bits of this, but just to kind of crystallize the point, that another flaw in the DOE's approach, I think, and method in terms of how they're handling these child care slots is that there are times when, and I'm sure providers would, would agree, there are times when a child might live with a family in a certain dress but grandma, grandpa, or another relative lives at another address, or mom or dad might work at another address, and they, this helps with certain flexibility to accommodate the challenges of working families in New York, or and 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 who their who their primary caretaker is as far as to, to pick them up, and so forth. So providers, that's why you work as as you mentioned, chair, when you work from the bottom up it's not only the right thing to do, it's, it, it also, it makes, it makes us the most, uh, in, it makes us more informed as far as meeting the needs of where families are at. Um, families are different, they have unique needs, you know, and so I think it's, it, it just showed another flaw in the top-down approach 
because it just ignores the realities of what folks are facing on the ground. Um, and I think that providers provide families not just a critical service, but also a, a certain level of flexibility that really goes a long way as well. Great, thank you very much. And I think we might have a new moderator. I'd share with them all. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Apologies and thank you. Uh, we just had a technical difficulty for one moment. Um, thank you, Chairs Traeger and Rosenthal. Uh, my name is Brenda McKinney and I'm counsel of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. And I'll just be stepping in for one moment. Um, so we are going to call the next panel if we're ready, Chairs. Um, the next panel will be, I will call all the members um, as a panel and then individually. Uh, Leah Van Helsima, apologies for any pronunciation issues. Daryl Hornick Becker, Shana Hewitt, Leah Kix Miller, and Gladys Jones. So the next panelist and witness will be Leah Van Helsima. You may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today. My name is Leah Van Halsema and I'm the director for the Early Care and Education Institute at the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families, better known by its acronym CHCF. As one of New York City's four child care resource and referral agencies, we provide high quality, culturally responsive support services for the child care workforce. In CHCF's case, specifically and overwhelmingly Spanish speaking home based child care providers. We also support families with individualized child care resource and referral services. And as of July 2020, we also hold a DOE SEC network contract serving districts 7 through 12 in the Bronx. Family child care programs are small businesses owned and operated overwhelmingly by women of color, many of whom speak a primary language other than English. This sector has always been essential to the overall financial stability of working families and the city and state economies. 2020 is no exception. During the COVID-19 pandemic, home-based FCC providers have served New York City's essential workers tirelessly, even as their center-based counterparts were closed for months, and now continue to serve the larger workforce returning to their pre-COVID rhythms, all while enrollment numbers have dropped precariously and their small businesses hang by a thread. The challenges that family child care providers are facing were already well entrenched prior to the pandemic, both in state and city child care systems. The DOE consulted with many FCC experts and providers in the field, CHCF included, as they designed the current FCC network structure. We offered free counsel and named system design flaws that would destabilize the FCC sector and the working, the working families who rely on it. Far from honoring these recommendations, the DOE maintains provider payment rates that are insufficient to maintain their programs. They offered five-year fixed contracts with no cost of living adjustments, and they refused to guarantee a percentage, a percentage contract payout to sustain the cost of running growing and thriving programs and networks. Given the low rates that they are paid for service, insufficient supplies and supports in response to the pandemic, the lack of guidance on allowable program adjust adjustments to reflect the current reality and on enrollment, DOE network providers and organizations are simply not receiving the necessary secured funds needed to survive the pandemic. This reality is felt for independent, unaffiliated providers as well. FCC programs were not engaged in city-run city systems for children of essential workers, cutting them off from funding that could keep their businesses afloat. Very few providers were successfully able to access the SBA loans or other small business relief grants at the state and city levels, and dispersal of federal CARES dollars for childcare has been overwhelmingly delayed thus far. Further, as essential and non-essential workers have become, begun returning to the workforce, both ACS and H HRA processing of applications for subsidy has come to a near standstill, stagnating not only parent ability to fully return to work, but impeding the flow of urgently needed funds into childcare businesses. We have to collectively recognize that it is not in anyone's best interest that these programs be left to collapse as we know that childcare will continue to be an essential need for working families and the health of our economy. The collapse of the home-based childcare sector will undoubtedly devastate working families and their ability to fully return to work, overwhelmingly in low-income communities, immigrant communities, and communities of color. We ask that the council please see our full written testimony for recommendations on addressing the needs of the sector. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. The next witness will be Daryl Hornick-Becker. Thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon. 
My name is Daryl Hornick-Becker, and I'm a policy associate at Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Traeger, and all the members of the Women and Gender Equity and Education Committees for holding today's hearing. For our full set of recommendations, I refer you to my written testimony. Today, I'll highlight just a few areas where action is sorely needed. First, child care providers must receive every support necessary to remain open and safely providing care. This includes incentive pay for the early child educators who have been and continue to be on the front lines of the pandemic, as well as expedited staff clearances for programs and better interagency coordination between the DOE, DYCD, and DOHMH to ensure programs have the capacity, staff, and support they need to adequately run either their childcare programs or a Learning Bridges site. Additionally, center and home-based childcare settings need help paying for PPE and deep cleaning costs, and early child educators outside schools deserve the same priority access to testing as those in schools. Second, the city must honor its commitment to salary parity and preserve childcare funding. The hard-fought parity agreement reached last year is essential to both the short-term and long-term stability of UPK and to the CBOs responsible for the majority of UPK sites. It is imperative that the salary increases and the sector as a whole are held harmless from austerity measures. Third, new childcare contracts cannot result in a loss of seats or a loss of full day services. As the DOE awards new seats for its entire birth to five childcare system, it must ensure that new awards do not result in any loss of capacity. This means no fewer seats, but importantly, it also means no loss of current full day offerings. For working families, childcare that ends at 3 p.m. is simply not an option. Additionally, we are concerned that new awards may exacerbate issues around the dearth of affordable full day care. Childcare deserts certainly exist in New York City, but there is real risk that in attempting to address capacity in particular communities, awards could create childcare deserts elsewhere. Their procurement process may be administrative on its surface, but a provider losing a contract with the DOE or seeing a reduction means a real loss of services and opportunities for children and families. Finally, the city must address its infant and toddler care affordability crisis. CCC recently published an analysis that shows even before COVID-19, access to early care for infants and toddlers was unaffordable for most families. Citywide, the annual cost of center-based childcare for infants and toddlers consumes almost a third of median household income for families with young children. In communities where incomes are lower, this cost burden consumes as much as 65% of median income. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has likely exacerbated this crisis. The city must do everything it can to protect current capacity for infant and toddler care against the dual threat of budget cuts and shift in capacity in new contracts. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Shana Hewitt. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Shana Hewitt, and I am the Director of Early Childhood Education at Shelter in Arms. Thank you, Chairs Traeger and Rosenthal, for the opportunity to testify before you today. Sheltering Arms is one of the city's largest providers of education, youth development, and community and family well being programs for the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. Our early childhood education program includes nine centers in the South Bronx, Harlem, Queens, and Brooklyn, which serve nearly 700 children and their families each year. Throughout the pandemic, we have adjusted programming and learned new ways of connecting with families some of which allow us to provide more flexible and accessible support moving forward. I am testifying before you today to highlight some of the challenges that remain. My full testimony will be submitted, so I'll focus on key points here. Under enrollment. The impact of COVID-19 on the families we serve cannot be overstated. Children have lost parents, families have lost income, food insecurity has increased dramatically, and like parents across the country, our families have had to figure out how to balance work with their children's education. In April, one of our families suffered the loss of the father due to COVID. The father always worked while mom stayed home. So this was a devastating emotional and financial loss for the family. Our Early Head Start program provided this family with mental health services and intensive family support to assist her with navigating the medical and benefit system during her husband's illness and death. After his death, the mother's family came together to help her obtain a small studio apartment in the Bronx for her and her three sons, ages 14, 10, and two. 
The mother now has to work long hours at a nail salon six days a week and is overwhelmed with not being able to help any of her children with remote learning. Instead, the mother relies on the help of their babysitter and grandmother, who are both limited in education and the technology skills to watch the children during the day and to help with remote learning as best as possible. We were eventually successful in enrolling the youngest child in our blended learning option and continue to support the babysitter and grandmother as much as possible during the remote learning days. This family's experience demonstrates many of the challenges that our families and our centers continue to face. While more than two thirds of our families have opted for in-person or blended learning, many families are still fearful of bringing their children to school on site. And those who are unable to balance remote learning and work have opted instead to leave their children with sitters or family members who may be unwilling or unable to assist children with remote learning due to language or technology barriers. Across our nine centers, enrollment this year is down 16% compared to last year. For some of our centers, this is the first time they have been under-enrolled in several years. Time expired. We join UNH in, earning, in urging the Department of Education to extend full contract payments to ensure that providers are not financially penalized for under-enrollment throughout this crisis. Mental health and well-being. Additionally, while our staff have been able to support families in need throughout the pandemic, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 physically, emotionally, and financially on Black and Latinx communities in New York City has fallen on both the families in our program and our staff members who are 97% women and 98% people of color. New York City has invested significant resources into mental health support in recent years through programs like Trauma Smart and Connections to Care, but our communities and staff have experienced incredible traumas this year and need additional support. We urge the city to provide additional resources, including on-site mental health counseling in our ECE centers to support the growing mental health needs of staff and families, especially for our BIPOC mothers. Child care for essential staff. Finally, we urge the Department of Education to simplify and streamline the application process for Learning Bridges. Our staff have reported waiting up to six weeks for the time, from the time they apply to when their ch children are finally enrolled. During this waiting period, staff often have to use sick or vacation time in order to stay home with their children. We're grateful for this dedicated option to our essential staff, but a more efficient application process is needed. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and for fighting for our children, families, and staff. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will turn to Leah Kix Miller. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Trigger and council members of the Committee on Education for the opportunity to submit testimony on DYCD Learning Labs. My name is Leah Kixmiller, and I'm a program director at Good Shepherd Services at PS224 Learning Lab located in Brooklyn. Before this role, I served as program director of an after school program at Launch Charter School in Brooklyn for almost four years. Helping the City Implement Learning Labs has been an amazing experience because of our ability to meet the needs of the community and to support families during this difficult time. Families that have enrolled in the PS224 program do so because they need childcare, access to technology and Wi-Fi for their children, assistance with helping their children navigate remote learning, or assistance in navigating language barriers. Good Shepherd Services operates five learning labs and annually our education programs serve over 10,000 students. Thus far directing a learning lab has been challenging because providers receive numerous and conflicting communications, have a limited way to get questions answered and the city is making decisions around enrollment and the model without including the provider or community voice. In order to enroll participants, both families and providers need to jump through numerous hoops and the process can take weeks while families wait for needed services. When providers, families, or school administration have questions related to the learning labs, including enrollment, it is challenging to get a clear answer. All the while we're receiving critical information that impacts our programming and the families we support in the mayor's press conferences. To date, we have enrolled 29 participants and have been averaging 20 to 25 participants per day. 
Providers are required to take daily attendance through multiple platforms, which include logging in attendance on DYCD Connect, a paper version of a new DOH form, and on the Learning Labs DOE tracker. DYCD also sends frequent surveys where they ask us specific attendance related questions. Technology continues to be an issue, and while Good Shepherd Services has ordered devices to keep up with the need, it has been challenging to get enough devices to support the students. Allow me to share a day in a learning lab. Staff assist students in remaining focused, signing on, helping them switch between classes, schoolwork, different online platforms, attending speech, occupational therapy, IEP services, and other appointments throughout the day. During breaks and between classes, we have projects participants can engage in that try to meet social emotional needs and need, social emotional learning needs and build community. An example is we have an emotions chart in each room where participants get a magnet and they get to create a small drawing of themselves on the board. Each day and throughout the day, children are encouraged to move their magnet to whichever emotion they're feeling in that moment. This enables participants to express what they're feeling throughout the day and to follow up with each participant. Please feel free to continue. Thank you. The health and safety of everyone at the Learning Labs is a main priority. We ensure that everyone is kept safe and everything from our entry procedures to the way classes are set up and for social distancing, mask wearing, limited, um, community, limited sharing of common spaces and materials, and also to allow for constant cleaning. Earlier this month, the mayor announced that they would push schools to five day a week in-person instruction when they reopened. The news was concerning since it could jeopardize our jobs and provided no clear avenue to have questions and concerns about this addressed. This has led to fear and uncertainty across our learning lab programs and among families who do not want learning labs to end. In order to support CBOs who play an integral role in ensuring the success of learning labs, GSS strongly supports the United Neighborhood Houses learning lab recommendations shared in their testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I want to thank the committee for pushing the administration to be partners with the providers and community so that we can get answers to our questions and continue to support the children and family of New York City that need us most. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for your testimony. Last on this panel, we have Gladys Jones. You may begin once the Sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Gladys Jones and I am an early childhood educator in a residential setting for 17 years. I am the founder of ECE on the Move, an organization of 600 family child care providers in New York City, mostly women of color, immigrants and living below poverty guidelines as they take care of the city's children. We are business women supporting business women. At the onset of pandemic, family child care providers specifically never closed their doors, caring for the children of the essential workers, even through the pandemic's hazardous conditions. Independent providers are not affiliated with the Department of Education. We have tried to survive by applying to PPP or any grant without much success. Many of us have not been able to sustain our businesses or our families, hence closures of this valuable modality of care that is one of the most used in low income and communities of color. We ask for has it paid for those providers who are still here. We also ask that parent subsidies for childcare remain intact during this crucial period. A normal system of dropping cases while parents are not working have no place during abnormal times. Parents have a difficult time reapplying and providers' life-saving waivers are dwindling. Family childcare providers have been recruited to join networks contracted with the DOE. In doing so, there has come about a division of families, children, and providers. If the DOE represents a public yet equitable education with services for all, shouldn't these offerings be for all families with children? Shouldn't it be given through all types of providers of care? We ask that the council support a united early care education system that promotes continuum from the beginning, starting with infants and toddlers. Having DOE work with independent providers who have been ostracized. Resources from the DOE should be shared out for all families of any community of New York City and offered to all providers of care, regardless of network membership. 
a final resolution would be to shift public awareness to include all providers of care as a matter of choice for families. We have asked the DOE to post a disclaimer on their website that they are independent providers located in all neighborhoods and to include these providers as part of family choice. This is a matter of survival now and fulfills the waiting list of parents who need care. We have suffered pre-pandemic and the pandemic era has put the nail in our coffins. Easy on the move is submitting written testimony to further detail everything mentioned today and our contact details for updates and further discussion on these ongoing issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to speak our truth. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn back to the chairs for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much. What a perfectly put together panel, just really hitting, um, as Gladys Jones said, all along the continuum of care and the necessity of thinking from the perspective of the family, which is taking care of young ones, um, you know, to older, to older individuals um, and how important our settlement houses are, how important are, you know, even the independent providers of childcare, everyone is playing a role here. Um, and, and I really want to thank you all for your service. Um, if I could just ask, is it Shana Hewitt, Shana? I don't want to get it wrong. It's fine. It's Shana. Shana, Shana, you're with um, um, Sheltering Arms. Sheltering Arms, that's what I thought. And I was looking just online now of, again, your services, which are across the spectrum um, of family needs. And I really appreciate that. Um, thank you for sharing the specific stories. Um, you, know, the, you know, the student whose father died just devastating and uh, the work, clearly the way you talk about it, you know, the reality that this family needs all types of help. Um, and you were there to provide that for them. And yet the city might notice that, you know, you're under enrolled this year and you might lose some of the classrooms for your contract next year is absurd. Um, so I really appreciate that. I also really want to appreciate your highlighting that 97%, um, 99% of, of your staff are women, 98% um, of the 99 of the 97% are women of color. And I really appreciate your highlighting that it was a point we were trying to make um, to the deputy chancellor. Thank you. Um, and then I, if I could just ask uh, Gladys Jones um, yes. from ECE on the move, you mentioned that independent providers have been ostracized. I thought that was fair. Um, can you just talk, uh, so, so does that mean you, there are none of, uh, the ECE on the move providers are, have city contracts, DOE contracts, well, whether it be for anything? No, that would be un, un, untrue. We do have network providers, but that doesn't mean they don't have any issues. Um, what is happening is that we have tried to work with the DOE, especially during the pandemic, to offer our services. And it wasn't readily met. But if there's a need for children in New York City, why don't we step up? Why can't we step up? I don't understand. So even now, the PPE has been given in great abundance to the network providers, but not for the independent providers. Got it. <sighs> And have you tried, I mean, one of the things the Deputy Chancellor said over and over again is they will work with providers, they'll work with parents. Mm -hmm. Has there been any communication with DOE to try to rectify this situation? They know me well. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, thank you all very much. Really appreciate the hard work that you're doing and your testimony. Thank you. Chair, if, if I may, um, 
Just a very quick question to, I think, Alea from uh, Learn Learning Labs. Um, something that we have not really heard so far today, but I'm just curious to hear your opinion and your thoughts. Can you speak to the level of coordination or lack thereof in communication with the situation room that the city has put together? Because I've heard some issues there. I'd be happy to hear your, your thoughts, uh, whether you've had any, any interactions, what improvements are necessary. Uh, please say a few words. Um. Thank you. Uh, I have, I've luckily not had to um, had any dealings with the Situation Room myself for my program. Um, I, you know, thankfully um, everyone's been safe, um, so I, I, I can't comment. Okay, that's that's a that's a good thing. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain. I I, I have heard from other providers uh, where there's a lot of communication gaps and issues, but I'm happy that, well, fortunately that there's no, no issues there. Uh, and I think, I thank the entire panel for their, for their work and their powerful testimony here today. Thank you so much. Seeing no council members waiting to ask questions, I will now turn to the next panel. I will, for the last panel of public testimony, we will hear an order of speaking will be Shanita Bowen, EC on the, ECE on the move, Lara Kiriaku, South Bronx Rising Together, and Amy Chi from the Low Income Investment Fund. Shanita Bowen, you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Your time starts now. Sorry, Shana Bowen, it seems that you have not unmuted yourself. Oops. <laughs> you, may, uh, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Shanita Bowen. I am primarily a licensed early care educator in a residential setting, also known as family child care provider for the past 16 years. I'm also the communications director for ECE on the Move. We are a grassroots movement of currently 600 child care, family child care providers dedicated to upholding our stake in the early care and education profession. Thank you for dedicating another hearing toward child care issues as outlined by the chairs, um, Rosenthal and Chair Traeger. Family child care providers are first and foremost business owners who use their homes to provide care with very specific modality, offering uniqueness of culture, care, and early education. But for the sake of being available to the community's children, we avail ourselves in what seems to be the best of opportunities. But we begin to feel herded into initiative after initiative, which serves everyone's agenda and not look after the needs of parents or providers. Understandably, our focus begins to wane on the intricacies of providing the best of quality care as our compensation does not match the quality of care we wish to offer. Quality of care cannot happen without quality of pay. We ask the council for invigorating work on legislation to approach an alternative method for calculating the market rate to account for the true cost of quality care. Secondly, on this issue, as providers move forward in applying for new market rates as they are raised, it is a near difficult navigation to have to prove why even a dollar's raise is needed. To this point, we ask that legislation is also worked on to assist providers in accessing new higher market rates as the rates are raised. We ask that it is an automatic process and without having to justify why a raise is needed, especially when compensation was never ideal to begin with. We also asked during this pandemic that the city finds funding to offer hazard pay, as well as small grants to help providers who remained open with general operating expenses and keeping their doors open. I'm not sure that the deputy chancellor is still here, but I do have a question for him and I can forward it in written testimony. The question is, was the birth through five, um, 
withdrawn this year and will it be available in 2021? Withstanding your commitment to include family child care providers in network programming, again, many providers continue to choose to remain independent. They have plenty of space. Independent providers continue to feel as if they do not have an equitable or a fair chance at obtaining a contract. Is there a fair percentage of how many independent family child care providers are awarded contracts? Or are I'm they sorry. hoping on dreams? May I? Or are they hoping on dreams where they can take their businesses to the next level? As for, as for the DYCD, who may also not be here, the RFP, the Learning Bridges, was open for providers to apply to participate in caring for the city's school youth. This RFP was not clear that it was not open to all family child care providers. Independent family child care providers, who again are providers not affiliated with networks, did not believe that they were not, quote unquote, lead CBOs. Many of these qualified independent providers eagerly applied and were turned away. The result? Independent family child care providers with many open slots continue to wait to be called to work. There's no support for them on any website, pairing them with families who need care. There should never be waiting lists in caring for children. What is missing is partnership between any and all of the city's initiatives to wholeheartedly embrace the availability of all family child care providers, not just those who have joined the ranks of networks, but those who choose to continue to operate their businesses independently. Early education is not one size fits all. Call from ADT Security. Sorry, Sorry Elder in the home. Um, Call from Independent ADT providers want Security. the same opportunities and resources that contracts Call from that is contractually Security. given to networks. Oh my gosh, I feel your face. <laughs> I just want you to I'm know. I'm all during the home. I'm so sorry. That is no, no worries. I actually, I, I miss the sound of the old phones because we're used to the iPhones ring sounds. I like that. Yeah. Phone. It Vocal, rings the old phone as well. Thank you. Thank you for uh, hearing my, the issues today. Thank you. And I appreciate your submitting all that testimony as well, including your question. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Before I move to the next panelist, I would just like to add Karen Dautry from the Alonzo A. Dautry Memorial Day Care Center uh, to this panel. Next, we will hear from Lara Kiriaku. Uh, you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to thank Chairs Mark Traeger and Helen Rosenthal and the members of the Committees on Education and Women and Gender Equity for the opportunity to submit testimony on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on family child care in New York City. My name is Lara Kiriakou and I'm the Early Learning System Manager at South Bronx Rising Together, or SBRT. SBRT is a collective impact initiative coordinated by Children's Aid and composed of more than 150 cross-sector partners committed to building pathways to success from cradle through college and career with a focus on Community District 3 in the South Bronx. Family child care is an especially vital pillar of support in under-resourced communities such as CD3, and it is a critical component of supporting women with young children in the workforce as business owners, employers, workers, and students. Given the disproportionately high rate of economic and educational disparities in CD3, SBRT is committed to supporting family child care as a critical conduit to the success of educational and financial outcomes for children, parents, and the community. Today, I would like to highlight three areas where critical support is needed to provide quality care for New York City's youngest residents. First, current financial support, which is available on a reimbursement basis rather than through direct funding, poses a substantial burden to providers and excludes providers who need financial support the most. Secondly, there have been a considerable drop in the number of families receiving child care vouchers in the past few months, even as parents are expressing a need for care as they continue or return to work, leaving both parents and providers who rely on voucher payments at a standstill until that paperwork is processed. And lastly, family child care providers have navigated the concerns and risks to their homes and families while caring for children of essential workers, 
Yet these early childhood educators have not received any hazard pay for the invaluable service they have provided essential workers and families during this unprecedented time of risk and uncertainty. Additional information, data, and recommendations on how to best support family childcare are included in my written testimony. The research is clear on the long-term payouts of childcare investments with a return of $7 on every dollar invested into childcare. At a time when the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the dire inequities in low-income communities and communities of color, Supporting family child care providers is one of the most effective ways to invest in families, small businesses owned primarily of women of color, and communities, the benefits of which will be felt for generations to come. I thank Chairs Traeger and Rosenthal and the members of the Education and Women and Gender Equity Committees for this opportunity to submit testimony on this very important issue. Please feel free to contact me with any questions regarding this testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Amy Chi. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you to the members of the council for hearing me speak today. My name is Amy Shea, and I'm a program officer at a nonprofit community development financial institution called the Low Income Investment Fund, or LIF for short. I run our early care and education program here in New York. I'm here on behalf of our tireless, undervalued, underappreciated, and overworked childcare providers who are the true backbone of our society and of our economy. The ECE landscape has been shaped by centuries of racial and gender discrimination via policy, programs, and cultural norms. Caring for and teaching babies, toddlers, and preschoolers is work whose legacy is rooted in the labor of slaves and domestic servants and has long been relegated as women's work, which is rarely seen as real work. Therefore, ECE workers are perpetually undervalued. More than one in six women working in the ECE field live below the poverty line, and these rates are higher for women of color and for mothers. Prior to the pandemic, the ECE sector faced many challenges and equity issues, such as significant undersupply, underfunded operations, unaffordability for the average family, and an undervalued and disrespected workforce. These issues only got worse during the pandemic, and our city's home-based family child care providers experienced immense difficulty in accessing relief funds. Together with regional funders and local partners, LIFT launched a major fundraising effort to provide emergency relief. Many FCCs in the city, already operating on shoestring budgets, lost nearly 70% of their incoming revenue during the first week of sheltering in place. LIFT recognized that these providers were not just at risk of losing their businesses, but since they were operating out of their residences, they were also at risk of losing their homes. Even with $1.2 million, all from private philanthropy, dispersed to 182 family child care providers, it's barely a drop in the bucket for what child care needs in this city. 67% of our grantees, who by the way, I want to note 99% of whom are women and 98% are women of color, and two of whom are actually on this call today, so hi. 67% um, of our grantees had to temporarily close their programs for a range of three weeks to eight months, which meant that there was no money coming in during that time. A grant as small as $3,000 helped a single Latina mother pay her rent, pay her bills, and keep her doors open to her community for at least two more months. But we've run out of money and the bills haven't stopped. We'll continue to fundraise and to support our programs with technical assistance and training, but they need your help. There are over 6,400 registered and licensed FCCs here in this city and they deserve your support. Many of them, as already stated today, are independent from the DOE and they rely on private pay families. They are essential workers caring for the children of essential workers. Our city's economic recovery rests on their backs as it has for centuries. What we need from you is your ear, your heart, and above all, financial relief. We're at risk of losing these childcare businesses forever, and these providers are at risk of losing their homes and their livelihoods. In a recent survey in New York, 40% of the SCC, um, sorry, 40 of the FCC providers who participated said they will close within three months if enrollment stays where it is and if they don't receive additional public support. They need grants, they need funding. Much of our nation's inequities in achievement, health, and wealth, wealth building are born of the opportunities granted in infancy and early childhood. Investment, financial investment in early care and education is foundational to reclaiming this sector to build wealth for entrepreneurs of color and advancing racial and gender equity. I invite you to join me in this investment. Thank you for your time and thank you for all the incredible advocates on this call. It's an honor to be here with you today. I've 
definitely amongst my people. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and a more detailed written testimony will be submitted to your office with our full list of recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Amy Shea. Thank you. <laughs> Next, um, before I turn to our last panelists on this panel, I'd like to mention that if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you in the order of hands raised after this, after Q and A after this panel. Last in this panel, we have Karen Daughtry. You may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to this illustrious panel, uh, to all of those who are uh, in charge and have been speaking. We have been listening very intently. Uh, I had to step away to have a staff meeting in the middle, so I may have missed some of the things. And I do not have a prepared written testimony. I'm just speaking from my heart. I'm very concerned um, about the birth to RFP, the birth to five RFP uh, uh, awards that have gone out. And I'm very thankful for Leanne Scudito and Deborah Lorenzen who spoke so eloquently. Many others have spoken about the situations that community-based organizations are facing at this critical time. We've waited for over a year for the results of the awards to come out. And in the middle of a pandemic, COVID-19, in August, we hear that awards are being, provisional awards are being given. We did not get the, the, the memo, and we discovered that when we did get the survey, it gave us two choices. Accept what we've given you, which is one third of the program, or withdraw your proposal. Nothing related to a, a appeal or any of that was included in any correspondence that we've gotten. So on our own, a small center that we are, we've had to go to the union, to our city council people, some of them who don't even know what is going on. I'm very concerned about the top down uh, disaster that I think is happening with these awards. Our program will be cut 66%, which will leave us virtually unable to operate a program. We're in the middle of Gowanus, Wyckoff, and Warren Street housing, a NYCHA project. You cannot tell me we cut, all of our twos have been cut, all of our threes have been cut. We have four-year-olds, which we've been having since 2001 with DOE. Where are my threes and fours going? Where have they been reallocated to? Then when they could come downstairs and come into our building, which is a part of our this complex, I'm totally confused, totally, uh, 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 baffled, and it harks me back to the ill-fated RFP process that happened back in 2012 there, where, where programs that had been doing early education for years were completely cut, daycare was privatized. We have been doing this for over 50 years. In 2021, when July comes, Alonzo Daughtry Daycare Center, which I happen to be the executive director of, will be out of business. This top down, and then there's no mem no number you can call, no person you can speak to regarding any of this. It's an email, call 311. July will be here. I'm so thankful for those organizations that are operating and organizing. What happened to the meetings on First Avenue with all of this technology? Why could not they call all of the CBOs together at First I'm Avenue, put us on Zoom, and let us express what we're feeling? This is a travesty. And the city council, thank God for Stephen Levin. Thank God for Steve Levin, who Alonzo Dorchie was one of the only centers that came back after being closed unfairly in 2012. It's not fair. The city council needs to be aware. Uh, thank God for council member Ines Barron that made me alerted to this forum today. I don't know how many other centers were alerted, but I'm very thankful for that bit of opportunity to just express my frustration and I'm sure you can see it. It is a travesty to the men, the women and the children in this community that are trying their best to pull themselves up and help the economy. The government has made us an essential service. We are, this, we are open, hot meals every day, breakfast, lunch and dinner. We have in this program, full day, extended day, eight to six, which is what our families need. I wanna know where my twos and threes have been assigned to. Have they been assigned like our ones in 2012 were assigned to a program lesser than ours? I don't understand, somebody needs to help 
me to understand this. I'm about to retire, but I refuse to leave our program squandering and wondering what's going on. This is just not fair. And, I, and pardon my, my furor, but I'm so angry. Somebody needs to do something. Thank God for Steve Levin who funded us under discretionary funding when they had closed us down for two years, unfairly. That's a whole nother story. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, that's all I got to say. I'm just done. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes the last public plant panel of testimony. Before I turn back for the, to the chairs for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Rosenthal. I, I'm gonna pass to the end. Um, I think it, the, such a powerful statement from Ms. Uh, Darty that that sort of sums it all up for me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to the end, thank you. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Dorotrino, thank everyone for uh, their incredibly important work. Your work has always been essential, not just now. Some folks are paying more attention to, to this line of work, but it's always been essential. Um, this, th the answers or the lack of answers that we have received from the education department are not acceptable. Um, and we made it clear to them, um, even prior to this briefing, uh, to this hearing uh, on a call recently and more calls and more hearings will be scheduled that um, we're not going to accept the loss of childcare slots. We're not going to accept, uh, we're going to fight tooth and nail the loss of critical staff. Um, we have a childcare crisis in New York City, which disproportionately hurts working class families, particularly women, particularly I, the, the, the painful stories that I've shared with regards to not just food access and um, internet folks asking to help pay for internet bills. Um, a lot of them are from working working single single moms uh, that have been messaging me, including a number of, you know, uh, early childhood educators who themselves are parents, many of them, and they have needs. And some folks in DOE forget that their own, both staff and even contracted staff are themselves working parents. This uh, hits, and uh, I, I, I don't think, you know, it, we, we asked the question at the start of the hearing, are we doing enough? And the city was answering that they feel that they're meeting demand. Obviously the testimony here today has proven that we are falling way short. Um, we have a lot of work to do, both in terms of getting you answers, but also in terms of resources. Because at the end of the day, uh, hearings are important, testimonies are important, briefings are important, but we have to deliver. And that's why I asked, and I think my co-chair also asked, um, have they made requests of OMB? Have they made requests of the mayor for more resources? I didn't get a straight answer on that but we are entering uh, critical phases uh, in our year where um, I am getting word that there's some talk of what federal government is doing now, but I am not getting word of state and local aid, which if, which, which if, if that is true, that is shameful, that's unacceptable. We're getting word now that there's some uh, tension in Albany about a potential tax increase on the wealthy, which I support but I don't know when that takes effect. I don't know if that even happens. But at the end of the day, New York City needs to prioritize its resources towards this critical vital issue. And we can't wait, we can't punt this down the road. The need is real right now. So we will continue to do whatever we can from our end uh, to hold our state federal officials accountable, but also our mayor accountable. Um, and I just wanna just uh, again, thank everyone for a really um, your passionate and powerful work. This is, this is life-saving work. This is life and death for many families. This is, you know, and as I've said before with the deputy chancellor, many schools are not providing five days a week in-person services, uh, but it doesn't mean that the need is not there five days a week. And again, many fa wealthy, wealthier families 
uh, families from wealthier zip codes are paying for five days a week in per, uh, services for their kids, but the districts that we represent don't have the means to do that. And that's why nothing about their approach has been equitable and fair. They have not met the needs of families who need it the most. And that's what I believe government is here for, to be there for those who need it the most. That's our job. And we're falling short and we have a lot more work, more work to do. So with that, I'm gonna uh, thank the, uh, my, my co-chair, my colleagues, the outstanding staff, um, and all the folks who test testified here today. Um, we have a lot of work to do. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Chair uh, Rosenthal. I think some other council members have questions, uh, so I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I will now call on council members with questions in the order that they have used the raise hand function in Zoom. Council members, if you would like to have a question you have not yet used the raise hand function in Zoom, please do so now. Also, please remember to keep questions and answers to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will maintain a clock. You will now hear questions from Councilmember Barron, and then Councilmember Levin. Uh, Councilmember Barron. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Traeger and Chair Rosenthal. This is an extremely important topic that we're having this hearing on today. And I have to put in a, a provision, please, if you excuse me, I may have to jump off. Zoom has allowed us to do two and three and four things at once, and I may have to leave. For full disclosure, I have known Dr. Karen Daughtry for about 50 years. So we are close personal friends. And the way that I came to know her is through the daycare center that she operates because I was looking for a daycare center. My oldest son was about time to go there and I stumbled upon the Alonzo A. Daughtry Memorial Daycare Center, which was at that time located in the Y on Third Avenue. That's how our friendship and relationship, both spiritually, socially, and uh, otherwise has developed. Dr. Daughtry runs an exemplary daycare center. It is nationally recognized. She has all of those credentials. For five decades, she has been providing service. The only hiccup came as she referenced when it was, in my opinion, a very uh, poorly thought out, economically uh, motivated, racist system of an RFP, which totally disqualified the years of documented evidence of efficacy and success for black run daycare centers. And as Dr. Daughtry has pointed out, thanks to council member Levin for his support, for her to be able to maintain the operation of her center. A part of what her testimony talked about was the lack of communication from the city officials. She talked about the lack of acknowledgement or lack of making sure that important communications were sent with a receipt for acknowledgement so that if they didn't receive a package in a timely fashion, they could be notified that did not occur. And also the lack of an opportunity for input from those who are on the ground operating these programs that are providing these essential services. She also talked about the fact that there's a formula now that's being thrown on these daycare centers that talk about slots and allotment and not acknowledging the programs that are operating. I just wanna say, uh, Dr. Daughtry, I commend you for the work that you've done. You know, you've helped me for the raising of my son who is almost 50, he'll be 50 soon. I'm aging myself, but that's okay. I want every day that I've lived to be acknowledged. And, and to ask you if you might not in fact talk about the history and the impact on daycare centers that were black run when those RFPs in their waiting system and in their uh, measuring Where's system discounted black centers. I would like you to put that on the record so that I'd like it to be on the record, thank you. Are you unmuted? You have to unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have asked that the uh, the clerk uh, acknowledge that I would be asking you that question. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's a painful one for me to address, but back in 2011 or whenever, 
uh, the RFP for Early Learn came out and we responded. By the way, prior to that, we, we operated a center at 333 2nd Street with an RFP that we scored 99 on That's the right. RFP. So they gave us a brand new building and we stayed there from 2001 until 2012. When the RFP for 2012 was announced, I got a call the month before from someone in ACS that said, sit down, you are not getting awarded. What do you mean we're not getting awarded? Someone has said that Alonzo Daughtry is not to receive an, uh, an award. The month later, we got the official letter, May 11th, that said that we would not be awarded. It was a registered letter. There was an appeal process. We appealed it. And in the appeal process, which I'm very familiar with, the city of New York, lawyers all included in tow, must give you all of the details. We discovered, because we were smart enough to file the, art, the, the, the appeal, that they had our original uh, con well, the letter said, you're not getting awarded because you scored below 75, which was the threshold. When we appealed, we discovered that we had scored 88 and that there were three people that scored the award, two from the city and one from, from child care, whatever. These three people were called in and said, come together and determine why, th fix this disparity. They fixed the disparity by the person that had scored us 100, bringing their score down to 60 something. The person that scored us 80 brought their score down to, to uh, below 60. I'm and sorry. the person that had scored us 62 brought this up of one. When they averaged it out, they gave us 66 and two thirds, which meant we were below 75, which was all illegal. The person that called us, the whistleblower, went to DOI and reported it. I went to DOI and reported it. They took my phone records. They took my chairperson's phone records and we never heard another word about it. It was put under the rug. Our daycare center on, on September the 12th was completely closed. They would not allow me who had been in that building from the first person ever put foot in the building. They would not allow me to go upstairs and get my belongings on a stairway that I had walked for 11 years. OK, they put 30 police outside of the building because we refused to leave overnight to come out of the building. So we were closed from 2012 until Steve Levin, God bless him. And I see his beautiful baby. God bless Steve Levin found us the building we are presently in, in the middle of Gowanus, Wyckoff and Wallen Street projects which is several blocks from my church, which is the House of the Lord Church. We found the building, we renovated it, and he opened us with discretionary funding. Two years later, he said, are you applying for early learn? I said, no, I don't want anything to do with that system. He said, you must because we cannot fund you. So we wrote the proposal and we came back with um, um, UPK slots and we have only 54 slots that that we are licensed for in this building. We have put in a $358,000 kitchen. Talking about hot food, we have hot food here. Breakfast, lunch, and snack. Okay, so that's the history. And that's why we are here. And that's why I don't, I'm, I'm about to retire. My board called me and said, we found a building through Steve Levin. Will you open it? I came back two years ago. I want to retire and go on a trip around the world with my husband. But guess what? I refused for Alonzo Daughtry's signature to be taken off the landscape right. for foolishness. This is foolishness. And it smacks me back to somebody someplace making a decision. They privatized childcare then. Some said some sponsors got 42 programs that they could no longer operate. Some of my friends dealing with family daycare were out of business and then were called later. Their providers called back to see if they could swipe them off and put them under another network. This has to be rectified. Thank God that the city council stepped in. I know buildings that in 2012 had put the shovel in the ground. They were gone completely gone. Somebody needs to pay attention. The children are going to be the, the beneficiaries of this foolishness that is going on. We have not been, I would not have known anything about this unless I got a letter in December that went out to others in August telling me that we are being cut all of our twos and threes. We've been dealing with 3K for all is wonderful, but we've been dealing with three-year-old children since 1969. 3K yeah. for children is just another, uh, 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 letter on to three. We deal with two, threes, and fours. All of them are gone now except the fours. Mm -hmm. I can't operate a program with one classroom. All my staff is going to be out of work. This is not helping the economy. 
painful, Sister Inez. I'm there. I took. I know I took long, but that history is, yeah. is, is, is very painful. Yes, but it's important that it be on the record. And thank you so much to the chairs. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Next, we will have questions from Councilmember Levin. Time starts now. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and I just want to um, associate my comments with uh, my colleague, Councilmember Barron. Um, Dr. Daughtry, it's uh, great to see you. Um, and uh, uh, for everything that you've been through, um, and, um, and I attest to every word uh, that you said, um, and that is, it's, it's um, shameful how um, Alonzo Daughtry was um, robbed of its contract in early learn in a way that was so clearly um, targeted and biased. And, um, uh, and so I've been very proud to be a partner with you and and making sure that this wonderful program continues um, for many years into the future. The fact that now we are once again fighting to make sure that Alonzo Daughtry can provide those essential services um, is is beyond frustrating. Um, but you have my commitment that you know I'm I'm stay with you every step of the way. I'm only here for another year, but I'll I'm I'm here with you. And um, and and to just thank you for for the the, the decades of um, love and support and education that you've given to children of Brooklyn. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Seeing no other council members waiting to ask questions, I will now turn back to the chairs for additional questions. Chair Rosenthal. Um. I'm actually ready to close. That was um, I, I sort of nothing no, need more be said after hearing Councilmember Barron, Dr. Doherty, uh, Councilmember Levin. And that really tells the whole story for what's happening to so many families. Um, sort of, you know, decisions made from the top down that most likely don't really meet the needs of our families. Obviously, a complete disservice to Dr. Doherty um, and a disservice to all of our families that can't access childcare. And the impact of that is um, on women primarily. You know, something I didn't raise in the hearing, but um, I just want to get on the record is the increase in the amount of domestic violence or interpartner violence that's going on with COVID. Um, and the fact that the stresses of COVID um, is showing up in this horrible way, um, not just in her partner, but, you know, to our children. Um, and to our elderly. And um, I, it would, we would be prioritizing women if we didn't have to have this hearing today. If the administration was really taking care of our children, um, we would prioritize women. And unfortunately, um, it's not happening. So I, I just, you know, amen and thank you to all the providers, to this panel, but all the providers who are doing God's work uh, in taking care of the city's children. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back to you, moderator, in case someone else has something to say uh, or then I'll call it to a close. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal and Traeger. We have now heard from everyone that has signed up to testify. We appreciate your time and presence. If we had inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raise hand function in Zoom now, and I will call on you in the order of hands raised. I'll give that a beat. 
Uh, seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted for the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Rosenthal and Traeger, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Great. Thank you so much. Chair Traeger, always a pleasure working with you. Thank you very, very much for allowing us to have this hearing with you. It was an incredibly important topic. Um, and I'm just so impressed by the work of everyone on the panel who are fighting every day for our city's kids. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, and I hope that the, you know, that the administration will um, take some of the suggestions, the excellent suggestions that we heard today and fix some of the egregious errors like cutting any funding from Dr. Doherty's program. We wanna make sure that she can take care of the twos, threes and fours um, as she has obviously been doing, but really Dr. Doherty stands for is, is the, um, it, we're talking about her program specifically. Um, she's obviously put a passionate name and face to it, but really we're talking about all the providers in the city who are getting uh, screwed left and right by this administration. And again, I wanna make the comparison to the mayor's office. You know, the mayor's office exists, the Department of Education central staff, the chancellor's office exists, and they all exist. Why? Because they need to be there in order to allow teachers and principals to do their jobs. And yet when it comes to the contracts for child care providers, they're underpaid, they don't get the overhead they need, um, and, and the people who suffer are really low income women and women of color. So with that, I'm gonna call the hearing to close. I thank everyone for their testimony and being here today.